Greg Evans, uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. I want to take just a quick minute to say thank you to Greg and Mandy for uh, the uh, the roll call and getting everyone uh, virtually connected. That's no easy task. And if we're in a group setting, we'd give you all a round of applause. So we'll just give you all a, a virtual one right now. I also want to say thank you to, to the great efforts of everyone that made uh, today possible. Uh, lots of uh, long hours and, and good effort there. Thank you, team, uh, for that. I also want to say to our task force members and, and our uh, listening community out there that we, we are continuing to be concerned for your health uh, and safety for you, your family, your friends, and your communities. We know that the, uh, the past few months have been, been a challenging period for our state, our nation, and our world. Uh, but I am confident there are brighter days ahead. Uh, we know that uh, many of you have personally been dealing with possibly uh, illness in your family, illness in the workplace, and even uh, your community, as well as impacts of people uh, who are out of work and experiencing other major disruptions in their life. Uh, we know that uh, your priorities and schedules are, are shifting on a, on a regular basis like uh, we all are, uh, but we do appreciate your continued participation uh, in this process. Thank you again. Uh, we have appreciated the high level of participation uh, in these webinars, and we particularly enjoy the thoughtful questions you provided uh, on emerging technology last month. Uh, thank you for that also. It's been impressive to see how we've all been able to use the virtual format to share our questions and ideas. We've extended the agenda time today to allow for more discussion as it appears we are learning, hopefully, uh, to be more comfortable uh, in this virtual atmosphere. Our intent is for the discussions and these virtual meetings to become more robust as we figure out the next steps for our future meetings. The look and feel of restoring our face-to-face -face, face -face meetings may be a hybrid approach. Uh, don't get too excited, more to come on that. Uh, a lot of things to figure out. Our, our fine facilitator here, Greg Vaughn, is gonna share a few details about how today's webinar will work in general. And we wanna start thinking about uh, these virtual meetings as providing the same level of, of interaction and progress as in-person meetings. Uh, we, uh, we also appreciated the participation from members of the public uh, during these webinars. Uh, the webinar held in April and May for all three task forces included participation from 1,713 attendees, uh, along with 129 people providing public comment to the task forces uh, during the designated periods. Uh, these numbers are well above what we experienced during the in-person task force meetings. Uh, we're pleased with that, uh, and this demonstrates how technology can facilitate participation in meeting by members of the public who may not be able to observe a meeting in person. I uh, also want to thank the many members of the public who provided the comments, uh, otherwise via email, uh, letters, and other formats. Public input is vital to this process. Uh, public comment during our meetings and webinars is only one way for the public to provide their input. Public comments may be submitted at any time to fdot.listens at dot.state.fl.us and will become part of the public rec record. Uh, you all have uh, received the uh, public comments along with the uh, meeting five materials. Uh, we will compile and share all pub public comments received since February at our meeting set for uh, July. Uh, the purpose of today's webinar is to continue our discussion of another important topic, broadband. The MCOR statute envisions multi-use corridors and calls out broadband as well as water, sewer, energy, and energy distribution as opportunities for these corridors. We shared a link with the panel uh, discussion that occurred at the March meeting of the Southwest Central Florida Corridor Task Force with you, uh, but this task force has not had the opportunity to discuss uh, this topic as a group. Our experience during, during the past several weeks has, high, has highlighted the importance of broadband and other technologies. So many of us have shifted from working in a traditional office setting to working re remotely and embracing untraditional ways of, of interacting, vir interacting virtually. Uh, these past several weeks has also shown us where broadband connectivity uh, is uh, limited today. Uh, by embracing the vision of multi-use corridors, MCORs can help move us to a greater connectivity statewide. 
We believe that a well-planned multi-use corridor can accelerate broadband deployment and help expand connectivity and services to household institutions and businesses alike. Uh, today's agenda includes a brief presentation followed by a panel discussion. Thank you panelists for being here uh, on potentially uh, potential opportunities uh, for coordinating broadband deployment and trans, uh, transportation corridor development. Um, like other expert panels, we want to encourage you to take uh, this time to ask questions and consider the implications of these broadband opportunities for corridor needs and guiding principles. We also have some time for a group discussion, including about the guiding principles following uh, the panel. Before we go back to Greg, I wanna give you an update of our work plan. Uh, at this point, we don't know when we will be at the phase where we can convene in, in uh, large in-person group meetings. We will abide by the governor's executive orders and respect your level of comfort and your organization or your personal guidelines with resuming in-person meetings. That being said, we also believe that this task force can continue to make progress, whether we are in person, in virtual meetings, or in the previously mentioned hybrid format. Our focus today and moving ahead remains on how we provide you the data, subject matter experts, and discussion time needed to continue your work on identifying needs and developing guiding principles and instructions for project development and beyond. You'll see more of a focus today on applying what we learn about broadband to shape the uh, recommendations for your final report. Uh, this progress will continue on our topics at our next webinar later this month and then in our uh, July meeting, which will be held in whatever format is appropriate uh, at that time, still uncertain there. So with all that being said, uh, we'll go back to our facilitator, Greg, to, for you to make a few announcements. I'm gonna put this mic on mute while I move it. So give us just a second, please. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's great that we are able to meet again in this uh, in this virtual manner. We appreciate everybody's attendance. Uh, I'm going to briefly cover several topics right now. Can somebody... um, so as far as uh, the things we're going to talk about uh, upcoming here in the next couple of slides is we're going to review the public comment period the logistics for the webinar and our process for engagement, um, the objectives for today, and as well as the agenda, and update on the um, uh, task force work plan and a brief Florida sunshine reminder. The public comment period begins at 11.30 a.m. or as soon as we are done with the task force member discussion, Request to comment that were received by 5 p.m. yesterday will be addressed during the public comment period in the order in which they were received. Uh, from members of the comment who, uh, public who are speaking today, when your name is called, we will unmute your line for you to provide your comments within the allotted time of three minutes. Only one person at a time will be unmuted though. And if you have self-muted, please be sure to unmute before speaking. If you did not submit your request in time to speak, uh, to be able to speak today, please email your comments, as uh, Secretary Evans said, to fdot.listens at dot.state.fl.us. The webinar is being recorded and will be available with other materials on the MCOR's website. You will remain muted for the presentations, basically what I'm covering now and when um, Will's presentation begins. Uh, once we get into the panel discussion, and task force member discussion, we will shift to a more interactive uh, discussion format. In prior webinars, we ran through the list of task force members in order um, and unmuted everyone one by one. Today, our discussion will be more like an in-person meeting, as was said before the meeting began. Instead of putting up your tent card to indicate that you would like to ask a question or make a comment, you can use the raise your hand feature. Uh, we would uh, ask that you remain self-muted when not speaking, but you know, in order to reduce the background noise. 
Um, I generally will recognize people in the order that they raise their hand, although as we do uh, in an in-person meeting format, I may manage the flow at times to allow members who have not yet had an opportunity to make a comment to speak or to wrap up the one thread of conversation before we begin a new one. Please bear with, it, uh, with us as we shift to this new format, but we, uh, we hope that this will help to generate more discussion and, and make things flow a little faster. I want to make sure that members of the public who are on the line recognize that this raise hand feature is for task force members only. Public comment uh, will occur uh, during that part of the agenda. If you have self-muted uh, task force members, please be sure to unmute before speaking. A quick reminder, please do not put the webinar on hold or take another call as we will hear your hold music. Uh, one last note, we may have adjusted your username to readily identify you as a task force member when we need to unmute your line. So please do not make any changes to the username so that you may be heard during roll call and the Q&A period. The objectives for today are listed here to receive briefing on opportunities for coordination of broadband deployment with corridor development, obtain task force member input on implications for high level needs and guiding principles and to receive public comments. Quick recap of today's agenda. I'll run through a few updates on the work plan now, plus a refresher uh, on the government and the sunshine. Uh, then we'll take roll call. We'll then have a presentation from Will Watts on broadband deployment opportunities, followed by a panel discussion with subject matter experts. Then we'll have some time to talk as a group about the implications uh, of these opportunities for needs, guiding principles, and implementation. Uh, we'll then briefly touch on next steps and turn to public comment. The public comment period is scheduled to begin at 11.30 or as soon as the agenda items are completed and is expected to last approximately two hours. We hope all task force members will be able to stay on the line with us during the public comment period. Before we, uh, before we get uh, started, I wanted to take a moment to review a, a few refinements to the task force work plan. We have clarified the key products that will be developed by the task force as shown on this slide and documented in the task force work plan and engagement plan. Both documents were recently updated and posted to the task force website. There are three major components uh, of your recommendations as listed here, plus the final report. And we'll be focusing on the remaining, uh, the, the remaining virtual meetings that we have on producing these specific products. We will spend some time at the meetings reviewing potential corridor path courses developed by FDOT consistent with the guiding principles so you can see how the guidance you are developing will be used. There also is flexibility to identify other issues for consideration in the report as our discussion evolves. We've also updated the work plan and flow of activities for future meetings. This slide shows the key agenda items at upcoming meetings. Please note that every meeting will continue to include a public comment period, as well as an update to the task force on public input received since they last met. We also are looking at ways to continue public involvement at this time, including opportunities for virtual engagement, as well as in-person meetings that adhere to social distancing requirements. We are planning another virtual meeting in this current series, which will be scheduled for June 23rd, later this month. That meeting will provide a brief update on technical activities, and then we'll work as a group on more, a few more specific needs and guiding principles as we will do in our broadband discussion today. Uh, task Force meetings six through nine will occur in July through October. As uh, Mr. Chairman mentioned, we are still working on the format of these meetings and whether they will be in person, virtual, or some kind of hybrid, uh, but we will certainly share the, the dates and formats with you as soon as possible. Uh, what we know is that meetings six through eight will focus heavily on reaching consensus on the task force recommendations so the, the report for the task force can be drafted. At meeting six, we will seek to wrap up discussion on needs at meeting seven, on guiding principles, and at meeting eight, the instructions for project development and beyond, including implementation strategies. All of this work will uh, put you in a position to have the draft report ready following your September meeting for public comment, and then a final report adopted at your October meeting 
and ready to transmit to the governor and legislature by November 15. Today, we have a short reminder of the government and sunshine requirements. Generally speaking, task force members should not communicate either verbally, email, through email, or via a third party to another task force member on items under consideration by this task force. You may communicate on matters unrelated to task force member uh, topics, though. Uh, Mr. David Flynn from the Office of the Attorney General is on the webinar as well and can answer any questions regarding the Sunshine Law as it, re as it relates to the task force. Uh, when we get to the Q&A uh, Q part of the agenda today, if you have any questions, he can certainly provide answers there. All task force members were given unique uh, links to sign in today, and as you signed in, uh, we noted your attendance. I'll now read through your names and organizations and note who is present and who is not in attendance. If you are a substitute and we didn't recognize your attendance today, please send an email to Ryan Asmus at ryan.asmus at fdot.state.fl.us. All right, so we'll begin here. Um, Mr. Greg Evans, Secretary Greg Evans, representing the Florida Department of Transportation is in attendance today. Mr. Jason Peters from the Florida Department of Transportation is also in attendance today. Chris Wynn from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission is on the webinar today. Mark Futrell representing the Florida Public Service Commission was not able to be with us today. Tim Vanderhoof from Enterprise Florida was not able to be with us today on the webinar. Commissioner Jeff Kennard representing the Hernando Citrus Metropolitan Planning Organization is in attendance on the webinar today, as is Scott Coons from the North Central Florida Regional Planning Council. He's with us. Charles Lee, representing Audubon, Florida, is on the webinar today. Kent Wimmer from the Defenders of Wildlife is on the webinar today as well. Commissioner Scott Carnahan from the Citrus County uh, Commission is present on the webinar today as is Commissioner Anthony Adams from Lafette County Commission. He's on the webinar as well. Diane Head representing the Career Source, uh, representing Career Source Florida is present today. Paul Myers from the Florida Department of Health is present today. Commissioner Mark, Mark Hatch from Dixie County Commission is, uh, was not able to be with us today. Janet Bowman, from the, representing the Nature Conservancy is on the call today. Commissioner Pam Fiegel, representing Taylor County Commission, is on the webinar today with us. Mr. Chris Lee from the Florida Department of Business and Professional Regulation is in attendance today on the webinar. Lyle Siegler from the Northwest Florida Water Management District is in attendance today. Ms. Sherilyn Pickles from, the, uh, from Madison, representing Madison County is on the webinar today. Michelle Hopkins, representing Southwest Florida Water Management District, is on the webinar today as well. Commissioner Ronald Kitchen, representing the uh, Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, is on the webinar today. Christopher Emanuel, representing the Florida Chamber of Commerce, was not able to be with us today. Commissioner Todd Gray, representing the Gilchrist County Commission, is on the webinar today. Ken Armstrong, representing the Florida Trucking Association, is on the webinar today as well. Mary Cross, uh, representing the Florida Department of Education, is present today on the webinar. Randy Wilkerson, representing the Florida Rural Water Association, is present on the webinar today also. Chris Bailey, representing the Florida Internet and Television Association, is on the webinar today as is Commissioner Kristen Dozier, representing the Capital Regional Transportation Planning Agency. Commissioner Matt Brooks, representing the Levy County Commission, is on the webinar today as well. Susan Ramsey, representing the Florida Economic Development Council, is present today on the webinar. Kurt Williams, who is a substitute for Charles Shin, representing the Florida Farm Bureau Federation, is on the webinar today. Chris Stahl from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection was not able to be with us today. Mike McGee, who is a substitute for Dr. Lawrence Barrett, representing the Florida Gateway College, 
is on the webinar today. James Stansberry, who is a substitute for uh, Task Force member Brian McManus, representing the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity, is on the webinar today. John Groskoff from the North Florida Community College is on the webinar today in attendance. Chris Rito, representing the Appalachian Regional Planning Council, is in attendance today on the webinar. Thomas Hawkins, representing Thousand Friends of Florida, is also present today on the webinar, as is Commissioner Betsy Barfield, representing Jefferson County Commission. Ashley Stefanik, representing the Suwannee River Water Management District, is also present today. Peggy Hanrahan, representing the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, is not on the webinar with us today. Audrey Kidwell, representing Volunteer Florida, is on the webinar today. So if there is a task force member that we, that we did not uh, accurately reflect your attendance today, if you would just email Ryan Asmus and just let him know that, uh, that we've got that and we'll make for sure that gets uh, documented accordingly. The main part of today's agenda focuses on understanding broadband deployment opportunities in the study area and how they can be coordinated with uh, corridor planning. To begin the discuss discussion this morning, Will Watts, FDOT's chief engineer, will provide a brief background presentation. So Will, I'll turn it over to you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for uh, being with us here today. I want to give a brief presentation on opportunities for coordinating the MCORS corridors with broadband deployment. And then we'll introduce a panel of subject matter experts to talk through some of the details. <clears throat> One of the innovative features of the MCOR statute is envisioning that these corridors will be multi-use, including the potential to include broadband, energy distribution, and water sewer utilities. In the past few months, we've all been experiencing on a daily basis the importance of broadband and advanced telecommunications capability. For working from home, shopping from home, online learning, or medical appointments, and video chats with family and friends. We've also seen the challenges that many Florida residents and businesses have been facing in parts of the state that are not well served by broadband today, particularly in our rural areas. So this discussion today and the opportunities that NCOR provides is very timely. Before we get into the details, I wanna highlight a few key takeaways from today's discussion. First, broadband deployment is primarily a private sector function, and ultimately, the timing and location of these investments are driven by the market. Second, a transportation corridor is not a requirement for broadband to be deployed. There are many ways to get broadband where it is needed, including broadband and the planning activities of the transportation corridor can facilitate broadband infrastructure in some unique ways. The department wants to be able to support broadband where we're able. We recognize the value of improving broadband connectivity statewide, and we wanna work with the industry, other state agencies, and the local governments to be part of the solution. So broadband is a high-speed transmission link that connects people to the internet and other digital resources. Broadband commonly refers to high-speed internet access that is always on and faster than traditional dial-up access on a telephone connection. With compatible equipment, broadband connections allow a user to connect many different devices at once. The Federal Communication Commission, or FCC, defines broadband as high-speed internet with 25 megabytes per second for download and three megabytes per second for upload to a fixed service to a residential area. The FCC does have a single benchmark for mobile, does not have a single benchmark for mobile service, but they consider 4G LTE or long-term evolution as the best proxy for advanced communication capability on a mobile environment. Generally, this has an advertised speed of five megabytes per second for download and one megabyte per second upload. So broadband includes several high-speed transmission technologies, both fixed and wireless. Some of the common technologies are shown here, 
each of these approaches has its advantages and disadvantages. And generally the technology implemented is what makes sense from a market perspective. Often when we discuss broadband, you hear the term fiber. Fiber involves strands of optical glass that transmits data in the form of light. Fiber is often preferred as it carries higher carrying capacity and, and speed with lower operating costs, but it does have a higher installation cost. Broadband connectivity provides improved quality and higher quality of information, quantity of information. Broadband is considered a transformative enabling technology as it facilitates information sharing, efficiency, and productivity in multiple areas. A lot of these you've, you've experienced during COVID-19. Education, like remote access lecture, shared learning facilities, healthcare, like telehealth, telemedicine via high definition video calls, economic development, improved infrastructure to attract businesses and workers, agriculture, modernization through high tech and precision agriculture, mobility, improving safety, traffic management, transit, including the ability to telecommunicate, public safety, informed shared, inform and information sharing related to law enforcement, emergencies and other other risks, government service services delivered more efficiently, civic engagement, live streaming video and interactive programs. Studies have shown a high economic return from broadband investments. A 2016 World Bank study estimated that a 10% point increase in broadband penetration, for example, 70 to 80% can result in a 1.2% increase in gross domestic product. A comprehensive statewide study in Indiana by Purdue University in 2018 estimated that for every dollar invested in broadband returns nearly $4 in economic benefit. Florida has a high level of broadband deployment overall, but significant gaps in our rural areas. In its most recent national report, the FCC estimated that 98.3% of Florida residents living in urban areas have access to fixed broadband at the FCC standard, but only 80.3% of rural residents. Note that these numbers refer to whether there is broadband connection at that speed to the census block, not, not to actual adoption by individual households. <clears throat> Several of the counties with particularly high percentage of unserved and underserved residents are in the MCOR study areas. For example, Dixie, Levy, Gilchrist, and Jefferson counties all had less than 30% broadband access in 2017. The map here shows where there are large concentration of providers and service in the study area, yellow, red, and areas in which there are few or no providers. Ryan will cover some of these, some of this data in more detail later in the presentation. <clears throat> Here is a simplified schematic view of high-speed internet network infrastructure from the public internet to the consumer. The infrastructure is, is composed of broadband provider, backbone trunk line, middle mile, and last mile or service provider link. The infrastructure has two forms of data transmission, wire through fiber, cable or DSL, and wireless via satellite or microwave station. The backbone consists of a very large capacity trunk, usually fiber optics that connects to multiple lines capable of transmitting large amounts of data. It provides a path for exchange of information that local or regional networks can connect with for long distance data transmission. These data routes and backbone connectors are owned by private providers, commercial, government, academic, or other network centers. <clears throat> the middle mile links the backbone to the internet service provider or telecommunications provider's core network or telecommunications exchange. In some communities, the middle mile may connect to anchor institutions such as schools, hospitals, public buildings that enable them to share applications, infrastructure, and other resources. The last mile brings the connections to the resident's home, 
and small businesses within the telephone exchange or cable company servicing the area. Rural and underserved communities often have limited middle mile and last mile infrastructure. <clears throat> like other forms of infrastructure, broadband deployment can be very expensive. The USDOT estimates the average cost of fiber deployment at a wide range of 6,600 to $267,000 per mile. A recent experience installing ITS fiber for traffic cameras and variable message sign as an agency, as an agency has been around 72,000 per mile. The National Inter Internet and Television Association has established that capital costs account for about half of the cost providing fiber with the remaining represented by operating costs. In the National Broadband Plan dated 2010, the FCC estimated about three quarters of the capital costs is associated with placement of the fiber, either in the ground or other poles. And they've estimated running a strand of fiber through an existing conduit is three to four times less expensive than a new build. So whatever we can do to bring the capital cost, placement cost helps make the entire deployment more effective. As I mentioned at the start of the presentation, broadband deployment is a private sector market-driven function. However, given our statutory capabilities and the economics just discussed, we do believe there are opportunities for MCORs and other transportation corridors to facilitate broadband deployment. First, transportation right-of-way can be a location for broadband conduit fiber or wireless systems, reducing the cost for, for, for providers. They can be helpful, particularly in building out the middle mile systems. Secondly, we, we can coordinate highway construction with broadband installation. For example, dig once approaches where we install conduit as we're building highways, either to meet current demand or to have availability for future demand. In some cases, there may be opportunity to place fiber on utility poles if an electric utility is considering including the linear infrastructure in the right away. These types of approaches could significantly reduce the cost of deployment for both right away and construction. The broadband providers could contribute to the cost to design and construct conduits. FDOT procedures and federal regulations already contain provisions for accommodation of utility facilities along the existing right away of highway projects. As these systems are installed, we can consider where to provide potential connecting points for third parties to access conduits, similar to where we locate interchanges or other highway access points. We also recognize that the planning involved in MCORS provides an opportunity to take a big picture look at the future infrastructure planning at a regional scale to make sure economic development, workforce, education, healthcare, and other institutions have the connectivity they need for, for the future. In many cases, the community anchor institutions can help build the market for broadband in a smaller area. In fact, we need to consider our own operations as one source of demand for broadband in many parts of the state. Some other considerations to keep in mind as we consider these opportunities how to accommodate future growth and demand, for example, installing spare fiber and empty conduit now, upgrading technology over time to provide higher speed and quality, removing barriers to investment. The FCC has found regulatory barriers such as permitting process and zoning restrictions can delay broadband buildouts. Also slow transitions from legacy networks and services to next gen, gen networks and impede wireless infrastructure projects to employ advanced networks. This is an area where we all can work together. Providing non-discriminatory, competitively neutral access to FDOT right-of-way for utility and service providers by maintaining common carrier carriage and wholesale access on the broadband infrastructure. Also providing access for all residents, recognizing that even if we build out the infrastructure, there may be some residents unable to afford it or unable to take advantage of it because they do not have a computer or other smart device at home. So we need to keep working as a state to look for opportunities to close the digital divide. 
So we did look at other states for good example of coordinating broadband and transportation. We are reviewing these states' policies to identify lessons learned. Note that most of these focus on existing transportation corridors and they all reflect the unique market and regulatory environment in each state. Arizona's 2021 budget includes nearly 50 million in funding for smart highway corridors for the Arizona Department of Transportation to install over 500 miles of broadband conduit and fiber optic cable along designated highway segments throughout rural areas of the state. These corridors will improve the highway safety while providing broadband, future broadband capacity for smart infrastructure projects in Arizona's rural and tribal areas. Arizona state law allows the state to install broadband conduit in connection with rural highway construction if funds are received to cover the cost. The installation would not be paid for with existing highway or state general funds, but through a federally funded state program managed by the Arizona Strategic Enterprise Technology Digital Arizona Project. The Arizona Department of Transportation would be re requested to bury multiple empty fiber optic conduits along specific state highways using existing right of way wherever possible. The conduit would be leased, would be leased to broadband providers on a cost recovery basis. The providers would be expected to agree to install fiber before conduits were, in, were constructed. In California, in support of a statewide initiative to support broadband adaption, the California Department of Transportation, in collaboration with the California Public Utilities Commission, has been tasked to identify strategic broadband corridors to develop strate strategies for deployment broadband for deployment broadband in these areas. A new task force will build on prior examples, such as deployment of broadband along US 395 in the Eastern Sierras. This project connected 251 communities, anchor community, anchor institutions, such as schools, libraries, hospitals, public safety, and other government institutions, including three military bases, seven Indian reservations, and three college campuses. The project also connected to other service providers, telephone, cable, wireless networks at 65 points of interconnection. Also in Indiana, the DOT launched a broadband corridors program to remove barriers, preventing broadband providers from accessing right away along Indiana interstates and limited access highways. Under this program, Indiana DOT will assess a fee to industry for the ability to occupy space within a limited access right away and is intended to pay for maintenance and management of the broadband corridor. In some cases, Indiana DOT may opt for resource sharing agreements with broadband providers to expand state-owned data transport facilities in areas where the state does not have broadband infrastructure. <clears throat> House, Bill, House, House Bill 969 passed this past year by Florida legislature has several important provisions related to broadband. The bill is now on the governor's office for signature. It designates the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity as the lead agency to facilitate broadband expansion in Florida. It creates the Florida Office of Broadband within DEO for the purpose of developing, marketing, and promoting broadband internet service to the state. It requires DEO to create a strategic plan to increase broadband use in Florida. This plan must include a process to review and verify public input regarding transmission speeds and availability of internet service. One key outcome of the, of the plan is to position the state to apply for federal grants from the FCC, US Department of Agriculture, and other agencies. This office, this office also is authorized to build and facilitate local technology planning partnerships, encourage the use of broadband internet service, especially in the rural, unserved, and underserved communities of the state through the grant programs and monitor, participate in, and provide input in proceedings of the FCC and other agencies to ensure Florida is the best position to benefit from the federal state broadband deployment programs. It also defines underserved areas as Florida, in Florida as geographic areas with no broadband provider offering a connection speed greater than 10 megabytes up, upload and one megabytes download. 
It also, also authorizes FDOT to spend $5 million annually starting in fiscal year 22-23 for projects to assist in broadband deployment within or in adjacent to a multi-use corridor with priority for rural areas of opportunity. If this bill is signed into law by the governor, we will develop guidelines on how these funds will be used in support of the statewide broadband strategic plan. The $5 million through FDOT can help other private sector, state, and federal sources. We anticipate opportunities to build partnerships with the private sector, building on some of the examples and others, building on other examples of other states. We also anticipate the ability to leverage the work of other agencies, including the new responsibility provided by DEO and House Bill 969. This, this slide shows some of the potential funding sources from other federal agencies available to assist in planning for and implementation of broadband. As we get ready to hear from the rest of our panelists, here's some topics a task force could discuss later in today's agenda. Discuss the need for broad, broadband and how it supports other identified needs in the study area. Refine guiding principles related to broadband and provide implementation guidance to FTFT and other partners. With that, I appreciate the participation of the panelists. Back to you, Greg. Thank you, Will. Um, so now just to let out the, the, the task force know, we're, we're going to hold questions for Will on his presentation or any topics that, that he spoke on and addressed until we get to the panel, um, to the panel discussion. Um, We'd now like to convene a brief discussion among our subject matter experts that we've uh, compiled to help us think about specific deployment opportunities uh, within the study area. Um, today, we, we have six subject matter experts joining us uh, on the webinar today. Uh, Brad Swanson is president and CEO of the Florida Internet and Television Association. Andy Williams is Southeast Senior Account Manager for Nokia. Justin German is a CEO That's of Systems Corporation. Create any way. I'm going to ask the panelists if you would just mute yourselves until we come to you. If everybody, if each panelist could just mute yourselves. Um, I think it would be nice for us. Around noise that we're hearing. I have to pick up the supplies. Members, task force members, the same thing. If you could please mute yourselves, we're in a lot of background noise. So, task force members, uh, if you could just mute your mute your phones till we come to you, um, it would be good. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I can actually start getting this on there and I can just ask. Her. Yeah, and task force members, task force members, if you are. Hearing me, please put yourself on mute. Fine, we can easily reschedule or fill a hot appointment. So that would be very helpful if you could do that. Okay. Um, so again, we're going to uh, go back to the, the, the brief introductions here. Uh, Randy Williams is Southeast Senior Accounts Manager for Nokia. Um, we have Dustin German, who is CEO for Rapid Systems Corporation. <laughs> Mr. Jack Burge from uh, CenturyLink is with us today. He's community with the Community Development and uh, public-private partnerships section with uh, CenturyLink. Terry Brigman is a retired uh, former CIO and Director of Information Technology for the City of Lakeland. And uh, Mr. Charlie Dudley is the Managing Partner for Floridian Partners, LLC. In addition, as I said a second ago, Will is available to answer questions as part of this panel. Uh, the panel members have, have not develop formal presentations or discussions today. I've asked each of them to, uh, I'll ask each of them in a second to, to briefly introduce themselves and their organizations and, and um, their initial thoughts and, and kind of ex areas of expertise in regards to broadband. And then we'll open up for discussion. Uh, task force members, um, we will remind you, please, uh, please mute on your end until you are called upon. If you have questions, please use the raise your hand feature that is uh, part of the go to meeting menu. Um, I'll ask uh, all, all the panel members um, 
Terry, I don't see your camera on, but if you could turn your camera on, I think everybody, we've got all the panel members um, up there on video now. And uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you to, to each of you, and I'll, 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 this is the order we'll go through, Brad, Randy, Jack, Dustin, Charlie, and then Terry. So that'll be the order that we'll go in based on what we're seeing on the screen. Um, for each of you with your cameras. So I'll ask you if you could just take 60 seconds. So make it brief so we can, uh, I know a lot of task force members have questions. So if you could take 60 seconds, introduce yourself, tell us who you're with, uh, who you work for, and then give us a little bit of uh, an intro as far as uh, your areas of expertise when it relates to broadband, just to give our task force an idea as to what areas within broadband you um, you have experience with, so maybe that would help with them directing questions or, or whatnot. So Brad, I'll start with you, please. There was, okay, try it now, Brad. Got it, all right. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Brad Swanson. I'm the president and CEO of Florida Internet and Television. We represent um, uh, Atlantic Broadband, uh, Mediacom, um, Charter Communications, Comcast, and Cox Communications. Our, our members um, currently reach uh, approximately 97% of Florida's population, or actually 95%. So when we talk about reaching rural, it's that it's that remaining five percent, which is a um, sizable amount of folks. Um, I think my, my number one comment um, that I'll start with, or that I'll I'll leave with the group uh, as we begin here, is that the vision of this MCORS plan to make it a multi-use corridor, and the vision of President Galvano, uh, Speaker Oliva, and Governor DeSantis to uh, put this project forward. Um, is amazing. And I think from our industry's perspective, we are grateful to be not only a part of this panel, but a part, part of this process. And we look forward to the discussion today. All right. Thanks, Brad. Appreciate that. Hey, before we go on with our panel, uh, as far as intros, uh, one of our panelists, Terry Brigman, is having some, some problems. So, Terry, if you can hear me, uh, the instructions I was told, if, if you could um, log out of the webinar and then log back in and see if that fixes the issues that we're having. And then uh, hopefully by that time, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get to you for an intro. Um, so with that being said, Randy Williams, if you could uh, yeah, introduce you. I'll do that. First of all, thank you very much for allowing me to be part of the conversation today. Uh, I'm a 30 plus year veteran in the telecom market space, uh, started my career with a small company called Microwave Data Systems, moved on to another company called Scientific Atlanta, had a lot of interface with uh, the old hybrid fiber coax cable systems, which is the intermediate step to uh, broadband fiber to the home today. Uh, Alcatel, Alcatel, Lucent, and Nokia is where I'm currently at. So Nokia, uh, basically, we're the company that connects the world. Uh, we're the ones that provide 5G, 4G, LTE, private LTE, fiber to the home, uh, which are called passive optical networks, uh, middle mile, last mile, a long haul, all of those things uh, that have been discussed today, we're the ones that provide those solutions. So uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. Be good. Thanks, Randy, for being with us. Um, Jack Bird from CenturyLink. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, thanks for the opportunity. So I have about 34 years with CenturyLink, about five years in government affairs, combination of legislative and regulatory affairs, uh, about 25 years in wholesale markets, predominantly interconnecting our network with other voice and, and data providers. Um, the last couple of years and my existing job is in our consumer organization, private public partnerships. So I have responsibility for 21 states. We uh, pursue state grants. A lot of states uh, provide grant funding directly to broadband providers to increase broadband speeds or extend broadband services in rural areas also meet with municipal county officials with regard to partnerships also private partnerships which would be uh, 
you know, either a subdivision or a group of customers in a rural area that either want uh, broadband uh, increase, like for instance, bringing fiber to the home to a subdivision, usually those require some sort of partnership and aid to construction, uh, but that's predominantly uh, what I'll share at this point. Thanks. Very good. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Dustin German, in, re in regards to, uh, I know you got some good experience, if you would share it with us. Hi, I'm Dustin German, CEO of Rapid Systems Corporation. We've been a service provider for 26 years in the state of Florida, delivering uh, everything from the beginning of the internet, from dial-up uh, through frame relay, and now uh, fixed wireless and hybrid fiber solutions. Um, delivery to rural markets uh, via a variety of technologies. Uh, that exists today, LTE, uh, fixed wireless, and uh, PON networks. So uh, Rapid is a company, as somebody was saying, uh, the Nikia guy there was saying that uh, they make the equipment, we actually do the delivery, the work, and supply the service. All right, very good, thank you, sir. Uh, Charlie Dudley, good morning. If you could introduce yourself. Great. Good morning. Thank you. My name is Charlie Dudley. I'm a native Floridian, and uh, for the last 30 years or so, I've uh, been a legal and policy counsel to uh, the cable companies, Brad's uh, association and his members. So I've been involved in all aspects of the regulatory, uh, legislative, and tax, uh, and, and how all that impacts our uh, company's abilities to invest and operate in the state of Florida. Uh, look forward to participating in this. Again, I think this is a wonderful uh, venue and, and a great idea uh, for the state to uh, include broadband in their planning as they move forward with uh, these these corridors or similar uh, transportation projects. Very good. Um, and last but not least, Terry Brigman, I can't see you, but are you still on with us? Yes, sir. I'm here. I apologize for the video, but believe me, you're not missing anything. Video. <laughs> It's Terry Brigman. I did retire from the city of Lakeland at the end of 2019, but was with the city for 12 years prior to that. And uh, the city of Lakeland is in Polk County. Uh, we, the city of Lakeland, owns 350 miles of fiber. We started installing fiber in 1995 because we own our own utility, and it grew from there. There are over 100 city of Lakeland facilities that are on our fiber saving the city about $3 million a year. We also uh, look to use that fiber to the benefit of our citizens and businesses as much as we can. We've cooperated with a group called Polk Vision in Polk County. That's the county and all 16 municipalities work together to develop a broadband plan in 2013. And we've been uh, working as hard as we can to fulfill as much as we can in that plan. For example, uh, the school board has over 160 schools in the county. The 50 that are in the city of Lakeland's territory, those schools own municipal fiber, saving them a considerable amount of money and giving them higher speed. So, you know, we're looking to do everything we can with fiber to support our citizens and businesses. Very good. Thanks, Terry. Um, from there, you go. Now you're back on. Um, I will tell you this, if, if there's issues with that, um, you can try to log off, Terry, and, and get back on like you said, uh, or like you tried a second ago, but now 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 I can see you, so that's fine. Um, but if you but if you click off again, I can't see you, and you don't see yourself on the slide, and you wanna provide input on a question, um, obviously I'll probably go to the folks that, who give me that, the hand wave first, but after, the, after that, if you just wanna kind of step in and say, hey, Greg, can I add something? Um, I'll call on you, okay? Um, all right, so uh, task force members, we're gonna we're gonna open it up to to you all now. Um, if you would, uh, you can use your uh, the raise your hand feature if you want to speak, and I will call on your name. Uh, like I said, panelists, if you would, when you hear the the question, if it's something that you'd like to respond to, if you could just give me a visual cue so that I know who who to go to, um, and then I'll call on you to respond. Um, again, as a reminder to the public, um, public uh, comment period is coming up uh, later in the agenda, so the raise hand feature is only for 
our uh, for our task force uh, member discussion. So, uh, with that being said, um, I'm gonna gonna start it out with going to uh, Chris Bailey. Um, you had your hand raised, I believe. So uh, I'll turn 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 it over to you for a second. Thank you, Greg. Good morning, panelists. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, given your amount of experience, extensive amount of experience among you all, I thought I'd start this off with a little bit of a, a policy-related question. Um, I'd like to know what policy should state and local government leaders follow to promote broadband deployment in rural areas to ensure that broadband service providers can serve as many customers with the best internet possible? Thank you. All right, um, Brad. Yeah, so um, I think when we look at um, the conversation on rural, um, one of the key things that um, this governor um, has done and, and uh, they are doing right now is they are building the state's uh, broadband plan as the FCC um, deploys the, the national funds um, across the country. States with those plans in place or, or the ones that are being developed and are ready are going to uh, be in a great posture to uh, use those federal funds um, to to solve that that problem. I know Charlie's um, and, and our team has has um, been working very closely um, with everyone within uh, DEO and uh, the executive branch on that uh, conversation. So I mean, if Charlie wants to dovetail on that, but but uh, yeah, Florida's Florida's doing some good things to uh, get ready to utilize those federal funds. Charlie, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of things that can be done. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, you know, we talked about when you, when Will did his presentation, he talked about um, the uh, permitting. Uh, you know, what we believe that needs to happen is we need to have a set aside of right away capacity or or some sort of linear space uh, alongside the uh, corridors and really alongside any uh, future transportation corridors. You know, it may be uh, appropriate for the uh, the state to uh, to include uh, multiple conduits that are empty so that carriers can access uh, that conduit. Uh, we need to we need to plan on you know what I call the the crossings. Uh, when you look at these uh, corridors and where they may run in Florida, there's there's quite a few state and county roads that are going to end up you know obviously having some sort of flyover. And I apologize, I'm not a transportation expert, um, but it'd be great uh, for conduits to be built into those as well because a lot of, there's a lot of existing network that's gonna to have to be relocated. Um, anytime we have to relocate that network at our cost, it means less capital dollars uh, to deploy. Um, so I think if we can have a really good planning process, which you know this is the beginning of that conversation, I think, uh, if we can have a set aside of dedicated space that's available, that's technology neutral, uh, that's carrier neutral, um, I think that goes a long way in planning and it allows our network folks, once these corridors and routes are, are finalized and, and folks know exactly, uh, you know, from, from a mapping perspective, uh, where the opportunities are gonna be, it allows them to not only reconfigure existing networks to try and get to more customers, but allows us to plan future networks in a much more cost-effective uh, manner. Okay, and then Dustin, I'll let, you, I'll let you round it out. Jack, I'm sure there'll be something else you can hop on, but uh, Dustin, I'll come to you. Great. Um, certainly things can be started uh, right away without having to wait for uh, all of these routes and access to open up. So having uh, better access to uh, some of the infrastructure that's out there, existing poles and um, uh, areas don't necessarily need to start with all the linear footage. There are microwave technologies and other technologies that are available. We certainly do need some fiber access uh, as time goes on, but things could be started very well without that and without having to wait the time in order to get to the last mile. All right, very good. Uh, we got another task force member question. I'm gonna go to Kent Wimmer. Um, Kent, you have a question for the panel? Kent, are you there? Okay, we'll come back to you. Um, Charles Lee, do you have a question? Uh, I've got you, I uh, see that your hand was raised. Uh, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, 
and this is really for all of the uh, panelists. Uh, obviously, as MCORS is built, it makes sense that adequate conduit be included for broadband. And I think, frankly, we can almost uh, say that uh, that's probably almost a given in terms of what you're likely to see in the task force recommendations. Uh, with that said, uh, even optimistically, looking at the construction schedule laid out in the MCORS legislation, completion of these routes is not considered until uh, as late as 2030. And so with the known need for broadband in florals, Florida's rural areas, with the importance of broadband to the development of economic activity, uh, doesn't it make uh, sense that independent of MCORs and not necessarily relying on the construction schedule for interstate-like highways, that we see a major influx of funding from the state to bring broadband infrastructure to the rural areas. It seems to me like looking at the numbers that were discussed earlier, uh, for a couple hundred million dollars of state investment, much of rural Florida could be populated with the kind of infrastructure necessary to deliver broadband. Uh, could you comment on that? Jack? Yes, thank you. Uh, so a couple things. Number one, I, I agree with the, uh, the comment made from the task force member. Um, you know, the issue with, uh, with the uh, working with the highway system is, in the case of CenturyLink, we're going to spend a lot of capital connecting our existing fiber to that infrastructure, and we're still going to have issues with last mile fiber and extending from that fiber system. So, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I work uh, with states in 21 states, and many of these states allocate 25 to 50 million per year directly to broadband providers to help subsidize uh, broadband in rural America. And I think that is what it's probably going to take for the state of Florida to have a state program in addition to uh, this MCORS uh, approach uh, to have a comprehensive and a much quicker solution. Most state broadband programs, uh, you know, there's approximately a six month process. They award the grant, and most broadband providers have to have the infrastructure in place within 12 to 18 months. So much quicker getting broadband to rural America. Thanks. Thank you, Jack. Randy? You know, it's, it's one of those things where, from an equipment standpoint, technology is now available to do everything we've talked about and want to do with broadband. Uh, and Will had mentioned the cost is 80% it's, it's the cost of putting the fiber there, wherever it's above ground, below ground, or whatever it might be. So public-private partnerships are are key applications for for moving ahead faster. You know, finding ways to work with the utilities, finding ways to work with the cities and the counties, but also finding private partners that will actually have a business case to come in and start building these networks and and using using the infrastructure itself. I.e., Terry mentioned. Uh, that uh, tying the schools together or tying the businesses together, you know, finding ways to build these networks faster uh, with with a consortium, not just you know, not just the state funding everything. I, I think there's there's a lot of opportunities, you know, for for the citizens and the businesses and the counties and the cities throughout the state of Florida uh, with these type partnerships. And I'll, I'll go to Terry to, to to round out this question. Oops, sorry. All right, give us a second. All right, try it now. 
Now it says you're you're muted on your end. There we go. There you are. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm very glad to hear um, that you think that putting conduit in is a given, and I certainly agree with that. Anytime we dig a hole, we need to be putting conduit in it. But MCORs is certainly not going to solve the broadband problem. It's going to be many and numerous projects that we have to uh, use to help solve this problem. You know, from or from a city perspective, a county perspective, we may, we need to make sure that we're broadband friendly, that all of our policies, uh, everything that we have in place for fish and poll fees are broadband friendly, doing everything we can to invite the public sector in and help us provide more opportunities to our citizens and businesses. And at the same time, government has to do everything that they can to help uh, provide those same facilities. So I think it's going to be, we need to do everything we can. We certainly are doing the right thing by making sure that we're providing broadband with MCORs, but there are many other things we should be doing as a state, as county, and city. All right, very good. Um, now I've got a question from uh, Thomas Hawkins, representing Thousand Friends of Florida. Uh, Thomas, are you there? I am, Greg. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, thanks. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists for being here. I, I've got a question that I want to preface it by, by challenging something that Will said, uh, Will Watson, his introduction, and that's that uh, broadband is a private sector. It's led by the market and initiated by private sector. Um, and I think historically that's been true in a lot of ways. And I think that when we get to that last mile for the consumer, that's true. But obviously from our panel discussion, there's a, a, a tremendous public sector role here. And the MCORS legislation says that uh, MCORS is about uh, broadband distribution. And the legislation says that we can fund these MCORS projects, all MCORS projects, including broadband through the, the funding that's made available. Uh, and I, I think that that's, at the outset, our, our conception needs to match that with the, legis the legislature's instructions, not just looking at what historically FDOT has done as an agency or historically how we've deployed broadband. We, we really see, we're seeing in the legislation a legislative initiative to have a shift in how we think about broadband. Um, and legislation that came out of the 2020 session reinforced that. Um, it, building off that, in looking at the, the diagram uh, from the introductory presentation, which I think was really great. I'd never sort of seen it put out this sim simply, where we have trunk lines, middle mile, and last mile. Um, especially that last mile has really always been a private sector responsibility. Um, and I, so I, my, my question is kind of a little bit for uh, Mr. Brigman. What exactly happened in the city of Lakeland? Was there ever an emphasis there for that last mile responsibility, sort of direct to consumer? Um, uh, broadband services to be provided and then generally for any other panel members that want to respond kind of how do you see that sort of the nuance of that public private partnership working where we make sure that the organizations that have the best experience with customer service and providing a product to customers who's the private sector can can interface with the public sector playing a more aggressive role in in getting the infrastructure in place sure uh, currently, the city of Lakeland is not an internet service provider for businesses or citizens. We do provide um, the lease of dark fiber to anyone that wants to use it, including uh, the providers of internet services that might want to use it. Dark fiber is just, we provide the fiber only, and whoever we lease it to provides the equipment on the fiber for to light it up. Uh, the city did go through an RFP process to look at the service provider because we weren't seeing that we the movement that we wanted to see from the private sector. Uh, we always encourage the private sector to invest more heavily in our community, but it wasn't happening as fast as we wanted it to happen. And we understand that, you know, the private sector has to make money. And sometimes in these areas, it would be a long term. Uh, proposition for them to, to make money. So as a government, we decided we had to do something. Currently, the city of Lakeland has an RFP out uh, looking for a public-private partnership. Because when we look to do it at totally ourselves, it's risky 
because it's so costly. Uh, we wish we could do it, but it's very risky. So we have to be careful. Uh, I hope the city of Lakeland finds a public private partnership that uh, adds another provider in our area, just so that our citizens and businesses have more options. All right. Um, Janet Bowman, representing the Nature Conservancy. Janet, do you have a question for the panelists today? Uh, yes, thank you. And thank you all for um, providing your expertise today. I'm really enjoying it. Um, my question is, is sort of looking at the, the time frame of constructing um, the MCORS corridors, the 2030 kind of time frame. I, I'm interested in your perspective on how technology is changing and you know sort of the role of fiber versus you know microwave satellite you know other technology you know as as we get closer to 2030 Brad I'll start with you give us a second here sorry we trust y'all but we just don't trust you uh, so <laughs> all right Brad try it now all right. Um, thanks for that uh, question. Um, you know, when we look at the technologies that are coming down the road, you know, obviously my members um, typically provide a, a, a fiber coax hybrid network um, across their platforms. But when you look at Elon Musk, you look at the other um, companies looking at doing low, low orbit satellite type technology, you look at the work that Dustin's doing at Rapid Systems, where you've got point-to-point -point wired and wireless solutions, uh, you know, the market continues to evolve and technology continues to improve. So when you look at that 2030, you know, timeline and, and we we sit on, you know, the, the groups at the Florida Chamber of Commerce where they're looking out to 2030 and we know we, we're gonna have 6 million more people coming to Florida by then. Um, when you think about those types of opportunities, the technology just continues to get amazing. I mean, even even in the time we've been um, here doing these panels, um, listening to the technology that Dustin uses in his systems, I mean, you know, it's really going to be a portfolio of technology that's going to reach these folks faster than that 2030 um, timeline. Plus, you've got um, federal um, dollars, as I mentioned earlier, um, from the FCC um, and a lot of funds that are there to, to help uh, reduce those those burdens, both for the public-private partnerships and, you know, if they do it in a grant format for the private sector providers. So the combination of the policy and the combination of the evolving technology that's coming out, um, you know, is really, really making, you know, these areas, you know, more reachable, if you will, and um and it's it's exciting but the the portfolio of technology i think will continue to evolve and frankly you know from my perspective when you go to ces and you you look at what's what's coming out next you know out in las vegas you know it, you know the next invention is just around the corner um but the technology is you know continuing to to you know amaze and and reach those rural markets um uh rain did you have your hand up I did. Yes, I did. Um, you know, the thing is, is that in designing networks, uh, you got to design the networks with the future in mind. And by designing the networks with the future in mind, that means you're going to have technology updates, upgrades, probably every five to maybe 10 years. So uh, if you design the network properly, you'll be able to pull in all of those uh, future applications uh, without with with minimal impact to the infrastructure itself so the way you lay out the network today will determine how you can move to the future so design with the with the future in mind all right very good uh dustin we have a saying that the problem with wireless Hello. is all the wires Hello. so uh That'd be the first part of that that makes it a, lot, a little on the difficult side. But back to what Brad was saying in the last year, we've seen uh, wireless technology make it to 10 gigabit and then go to 40 gigabit worth of services. So it's very hard to say what's going to happen. We've seen the same thing with fiber, you know, exceeding 100 gigabit in, in transport. So, you know, as and then we have carrier aggregation and all this other technology that's coming about. 
So it's very hard to see what's on on the 10 year scale because I don't think we can imagine it at this point. And it goes back to that uh, Bill Gates thing that said, you know, we'll never need more than 512K of RAM and we were never gonna need more than 56K dial-up modems. But it the technology does uh, kind of leapfrog whether it's wireless or wired. But getting back to my initial statement, the problem with the wireless is all the wired stuff that we need to make it work. So, so Dustin, that, that leads me to, to ask a question, kind of a, a follow-up in reference to that, because in previous task force meetings, that's one of the questions and that we've kind of wrestled with as a task force is, you know, obviously trying to predict the future as far as what broadband is going to look like in the future. How is that going to be delivered? Uh, because of the fact that technology changes so much um, and, and it's changing so fast and rapidly but you just commented on something I guess that I had heard before and if you could expound on a little bit just about the fact that the wired is not not going to all of a sudden go away the wired is going to be needed in order to be able to provide some of that wireless and so forth could you explain that to to, to us who aren't as familiar with the, the obviously the broadband technology universe absolutely um over the course of designing a, uh, our network and multiple other networks we've always utilized a uh a wire i'm going to say wired and to an old phone guy like me that kind of means copper, but really we're talking about fiber today or some type of hybrid coax fiber type of solution that's out there. We've always used that to feed the tower sites and then provide middle and last mile via the tower site on the way out. Um, being able to scale that over time, uh, sometimes you can make some short term solutions by doing one and 10 gig wireless solutions to the next tower site or to the next tower hop. But eventually you consume all that bandwidth and you need more. And it's nice to be able to get a fiber drop that's out there. So in some of these areas where we're saying, hey, do I have to wait 10 years for MCORs to be done or whatsoever? No, you certainly could start today and there could be places that you could pick up service but at some point we need that mcore's backbone in order to connect uh and bring higher speed transmission in there because not only from a technology perspective can we do you know it'd be great if we could do everything wireless but all of us in the wireless game including the the other uh wireless carriers out there we have a limited resource in the spectrum there's only so much of it so we've got to balance that spectrum out of what we have along with what we can get via fiber. And that makes that mixed hybrid solution there that's really gonna bring the next generation applications out there to the rural areas. And, you know, quite frankly, to all the areas that are there, because in some places there's a glutton of fiber and in other places there's just not enough fiber. But it, it, it's gonna require it all. And there's gonna be leaps and bounds and advances in both fiber technology and wireless technology but we all know, going back to that Bill Gates statement, no matter what it is and no matter what you give us, it's like Hardy County. I could keep putting more and more bandwidth into Hardy County and they keep using it. The more I put in, the more they use. And rural areas that are hurting like this in Florida, as soon as you put bandwidth in there, they all go to Best Buy and buy everything on the shelf that has an ethernet port on it, right? And then they come home and they kill those connections and then they want upgrades and you're back in the same process again. Yeah, it's like my kids' allowance. The more I give them, the more they spend. You know, it's crazy. Um, all right, very good, very good. Um, we do have a few more panelists, I mean, a few more task force members. Now, now Kent Wimmer, you had your hand uh, raised earlier and we, we were having some audio issues. Um, Kent from Defenders of Wildlife, do you have a question for the panel still? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you good. Ah. Thank you. I'm not sure what happened before. Um, in the June 3rd Northern Task Force webinar, which I'm a member of that task force as well, a member of the public stated that the opponents of toll roads do not want rural areas to have broadband access. I just wanted to reply that that statement is false and disingenuous. Um, broadband access is a necessary utility for all Floridians. 
and it makes perfect sense to collate with existing corridors and to provide conduit. To me, it remains to be demonstrated how a 10-year MCOR development process will provide necessary broadband access to unserved and underserved areas away from the last mile in the near term or at all. This is especially concerning as the toll roads may you know, likely use existing right-of-ways that are already served with broadband and that the rural broadband alliances that have received tens of millions of dollars in federal funding have not accomplished these goals over the past 10 years. I appreciate Mr. Berg addressing that the $5 million in annual funding tied to the 10-year MCORS build-out will not make a meaningful difference to providing broadband access to rural areas that are currently underserved and unserved. The new satellite, um, the, the new the new satellite internet service that's currently that is literally being launched from Cape Canaveral will likely provide rural areas currently underserved and unserved before MCORs corridors are developed. So my question is, what are the necessary incentives other than DOT providing right away and conduit, which you're going to do anyway, that a public agency like that DOT can offer that will actually result in providing service to the underserved areas and the unserved areas in the last mile. So what are the necessary incentives the DOT can provide to actually get, get service in the last mile? All right, um, so there's a question, Charlie. Uh, Charlie Deadly, I'll go to you first. Yeah, I'll give it a shot. I mean, obviously, I, I appreciate the comment that the uh, access to the right of way and, and potentially, uh, it, you know, making conduit available uh, is a given because that that would be an incredible uh, first step, and I appreciate that. I talked earlier about um, including the industry more in the planning stages, especially with relocates, because relocating uh, our fiber, uh, which we have to do uh, when there's road expansions, is a very expensive proposition. It takes capital that can otherwise be used to extend networks out of out of our hands uh, because we don't have it after after we have to relocate the fiber. So that's a big uh, that's a big cost that we need to help address. I think with the better communications and, and talking between industry and, and governments along the way. Uh, and I think that uh, I know DOT is also in the middle of, of revising its rules to allow uh, wireless and other providers access uh, to more DOT right away, including structures uh, that are in the right of way. Um, I think Dustin can probably speak to that. There's a lot of, uh, of uh, areas out there that, that could be, uh, that new wireless technologies and solutions could be deployed to by having, uh, you know, reasonable, you know, cost-based access to some of those, what I would call public facilities. Um, and I think all those things are things that DOT specifically can do, um, you know, uh, to help out. Do you want to follow up on that? Dustin? I, oh, sure. Well, I want to hire Charlie now as my attorney. But absolutely, uh, from the aspect that uh, those additional access would be, uh, <laughs> those additional access points, uh, areas, and structures, and things like that would help significantly. Jen, I saw you had your hand raised too, so I'll let you round that, that one out. Yes. So, uh, and I, I can't remember who made the comment. It, it's definitely going to take a combination of of uh, state, federal uh, funding, uh, local partnerships. Obviously, the new RDOF that uh, is expected to have a reverse auction in late October is establishing a priority of providers placing fiber rather than just providing a 10-1, which was the, the CAP-2 requirement. Um, but, I, you know, I'll mention there's states that, that I have responsibility for that have been dumping 25 to 50 million per year in broadband. The state of Illinois has allocated 200 million over the next couple of years. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of these rural areas to serve them 
uh, and I don't know about the other providers, but it's probably a cost of could be four to five thousand per living unit. And uh, the economics just don't typically work in some areas. There's just not enough density. So um, it's going to take a combination of, of several governmental entities to help uh, subsidize the private uh, providers to uh, truly bring uh, increased broadband. And then the last comment would be, with regard to broadband, is it fiber or nothing? I think that's part of the question also. Or are there other, uh, uh, you know, either like fiber coax or in CenturyLink's case, uh, a fiber the node where, you know, we can get closer to 60 to 80 meg rather than uh, one gig service. So I'll stop there. Pretty good. Uh, Brad, do you want to add anything real quick before we go to in the next couple of questions? Yeah, just a quick comment. You know, I think one of the things we need to pay attention to in uh, this conversation of, of rural and, and outside the burbs where there, there isn't service, um, as these networks get built out um, and, uh, well, as these networks get built out, one of the key points that we need to consider is adoption, right? And so when you think about the cost to acquire, um, I know my members and, and our friends um, in the telecom space offer low cost internet access to kids who qualify for free and reduced lunch programs. Now, while there's a ton of people in Florida that qualify for that, um, you know, it, everybody's not necessarily aware. So I think a huge awareness campaign that tracks um, the, uh, the, the low cost um, qualified families for those programs where there is broadband um, and where there is connectivity, um, I think that's a huge additional piece as, as these um, rural areas uh, uh, start becoming within reach, uh, not just for our members, but for, for other technology providers. I mean, and when I talk about it, I mean, we're talking about $15 a month for a broadband connection because one of the children in that household um, um, qualifies for the free and reduced lunch program. That means mom and dad can use it for you know some job training or access to the internet. It really is a great program, and and the entire telecom and cable industries offer these programs. So so that's one that's already there that can answer the adoption question because we can all of us collectively can figure out the federal grants and 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 run wires you know. But the trick is is getting folks to to pick it up because unlike a utility. Um, it's not mandated for each and every house and each and every connection as a monopoly. It's it's a choice by those consumers. So so the knowledge of those those low cost programs being out there is important. Very good, good information there. Um, we're going to wrap up. We're, we're running a little over, which is fine. Good discussion, and and our we're getting answers to our task force members' questions. So uh, we're going to go now to um, Michelle Hopkins. Uh, you had a question for the for the task force. I mean, for the panelists. Uh, sure. Thank you, um, Michelle Hopkins with the Southwest Florida Water Management District. And I heard a few times that um, permitting and regulation um, was a hindrance to moving forward on some of the broadband. And I was wondering if somebody could um, elaborate on some of uh, what those challenges are, whether that's your local, state, and federal construction permitting or or, or if it's tied to something else. And I also, you know, uh, commend any efforts for co-location and, and, you know, planning efforts ahead of time so that um, you're minimizing impacts and utilizing existing corridors wherever possible. Um, and um, the other thing is, and we've had this on some other um, types of projects where we really, we've used a regulatory team with members of different communities to just um, work through some of the permitting challenges that exist and um, just developing really a, a regulatory roadmap. And so I'd be interested in your thoughts on that as well. That's it for me. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Michelle. And I forgot to, to mention that South, uh, uh, Michelle represents the Southwest Florida Water Management District on our task force. So just so our panelists know who, who's asking. Um, so who, who who wants to uh, who wants to take that one, uh, Terry? I'll start with you. Just a quick comment. I think uh, her idea of having a regulatory 
is excellent. So I think there are things at the state level that certainly hinder uh, counties and cities from doing all they can to implement and support broadband. Um, from the DOT perspective, I think one of the guiding principles should be uh, easy to use cooperative agreements between the state and county. So I think uh, looking into and attacking everything that's a hindrance to uh, getting broadband out to as many people and businesses as you can is a great idea. Charlie? I think the biggest thing is the planning uh, that we're doing that we're talking about now, but um, even your local uh, planning uh, with providers. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, I've, I've had a couple of our companies tell us that one of the growing items in their budgets uh, that's eating up cash that could otherwise be used for some of these uh, expansions of networks is relocation costs. So the earlier that uh, folks are involved in transportation and corridor planning, the better, because then we can hopefully place the network uh, in a location initially that it will not have to then be moved in, in three or four or five years. Um, I know the legislature's done some work uh, on permitting streamlining uh, that I think has been helpful the last couple of years. Uh, we, need to, we need to keep working on that really from an operational and day-to-day -day communication perspective between industry and, and local governments. Um, you know, there's, there's really, uh, unfortunately, I think been some miscommunication at times. Um, so I think those are the, the major ones that I'm aware of. All right, very good. Um, let let me ask the let me ask the panel the panel this um, question. You know, one of the things that we uh, we highlighted and really delved into to to a large degree on the last webinar uh, for our task force was uh, technologies, emerging technologies, and specifically looking at connected and autonomous vehicles, um, and and providing making sure that uh, the M cores uh, project, uh, the Suncoast Corridor, as it's being developed, is set up with the future in mind and trying to make for sure from a transportation standpoint that it has uh, within it the technologies to be able to serve, uh, you know, the, the, the users here in Florida for, for you know, generations to come. So the, the question that I would have is, is from a broadband standpoint, how can broadband I know this seems like a softball question, but I think really some of the devil's in the details of how can broadband be a component to providing, you know, those type things and and um, other other related kind of smart technologies within this within this corridor. Uh, Brad, I'll start I'll start with you. Well, I've, I've had this question on a couple other panels. So previous background, I was the intermodal administrator at uh, FDOT and had the privilege of of being a co-worker with the fine folks at FDOT. Well, Greg, we'll talk about Greg later, but uh, Secretary Evans. Um, but no, when, we, when it comes to autonomous vehicles, that was a uh, portion of that was under my purview. Um, having broadband as a component in these M cores, you know, there's, there's multiple types of autonomy. Um, there are vehicles that literally travel completely by themselves and they, they run off their satellite and their GPS kind of connection. But there's another type of um, platform set up called V2E, which means vehicle to everywhere. And cities and counties across the country are doing ground-based tests of Wi-Fi networks where it'll have a, a low, like we're talking, you know, a foot off the ground kind of thing, um, connections to these autonomous vehicles. Because when you think about autonomy, one of the biggest plays is going to be in how are you distracting the driver? So who owns the content and the the distribution to that vehicle. And, and when you talk about pushing video and huge amounts of data back and forth, you need to have that broadband at the road level. So when you talk about preparing these new corridors for the future and knowing that there's a broadband component, and we're discussing broadband obviously for its ability to help reach rural, rural areas um, with the broadband there, but the broadband at the roadside, um, in, in my estimation, at least um, for what I keep up with in, in the world of autonomous vehicles, will be crucial to the broadcast platforms that are happening inside those vehicles um, of autonomy. Obviously, freight trucks and, and autonomous um, trucking, you know, um, that's, a, that's a different ball game um, and DOT is working on those grids. But when you talk about your retail consumption of autonomy, um, that broadband signal and that rich fiber or that rich um, 5G-like signal will want to be carried in those autonomous vehicles. 
Randy, you had your hand raised? I do, I do. And just to expand upon what Brad said, going back to what I said before is designing the networks with the future in mind. Uh, autonomous vehicles in many cases require what they call low latency, real fast responsive, high data capable networks. Uh, if you don't have those already designed into the network, literally a lot of the older networks don't have that capacity. So as 5G is coming along, low latency is a requirement of that because of all these other applications that are now looking to ride on that network. So designing the network properly, you know, building with the future in mind, low latency, high data are all requirements of, of the future itself. So keep in mind where you're going. So design for that in mind. Dustin, do you want to add anything there? Are you muted? Are you muted, Dustin? Done it again. But yes, certainly 5G would be one of those first things that come in mind, but we are actually uh, working with and designing autonomous systems in mining and uh, um, agricultural today. And they actually fit more of what Brad is talking about in the V to E and the very low mounted um, type of equipment. So back again to access to those poles and having uh, those poles in a closer proximity because not every autonomous vehicle is going to utilize the same technology and then as soon as the first accident happens with the first technology they're going to move over to the next technology because something better or like most of us have learned really takes two internet connections to have a really good signal at all times so uh being a little bit uh more um forward thinking than, uh, than just a single solution out there, which today I think most of us would actually say 5G because it's supposed to be low latency and stuff like that. But what we're seeing today, other than, you know, Tesla's using 5G, but everybody else is using more Wi-Fi-like technologies, low band stuff, and stuff that's mounted really low to the ground so that it does that it attenuates within the corridor and doesn't exceed the corridor, giving it better performance. All right, um, Charlie. You, I felt like I was at an auction a while ago. All y'all were raising your hands at me. So, um, Charlie, do you, did you want to add anything real quick? You know, I just there's a couple of key things that I think has come out as themes as you're hearing these comments. Um, number number one is you know it's technology, it's changing, it's dramatically changing, and if we had all the answers, we'd be very wealthy um, because we'd be able to predict it. But the but we really can't. Um, it's very difficult, I think, too, for government to dip their toe in this water. I think there, there's roles for governments to play in terms of partnerships, in terms of, again, planning, in terms of uh, conduit and access to right away. But you gotta be really, really careful here with taxpayer money. Uh, we've had some governments get in really bad situations historically, um, and because it, it can be very unpredictable, it requires a lot of investments. And again, it's gonna be multiple winners and losers, multiple types of technologies uh, that work, that don't work, that fail, that then, you know, a phoenix rises from those ashes. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's you know, it's very entrepreneur, it's very venture capital driven, uh, and it's a risk that's generally borne, um, you know, by our investors and our shareholders. And I think you got to be really careful and cognizant of that um, going forward. There's going to be a lot of change. Terry, I'll let you round this out. Sure. Um, I think there will be a portfolio of technologies, as Brad said earlier, and certainly for autonomous vehicles and many other smart community initiatives, there's going to be a lot of technology. But I don't think any of us have to fear that we're going to install or invest in too much fiber. It's all going to go back to the fiber. So those are going to be protected investments, I believe. All right, we've got uh, just final two questions and we got to wrap up because we are we are running along. But like I said, it's good discussion. Um, so I want to go to um, Commissioner Betsy Barfield representing Jefferson County. Um, Commissioner Barfield, did you have a question for the panel? It's not necessarily a question. It is a comment. 
And I do believe that uh, connectivity is um, the most important aspect of this infrastructure, particularly in Jefferson County and our surrounding uh, friends um, of Jefferson County. And Charlie talked about planning and the devil is in the detail. And um, seriously, I believe this panel who has a wealth of knowledge should be appointed as a sub task force to the task force to make sure that we design the best, fastest and most cost feasible network for the corridors. Um, and I would also add a grant specialist to help find the money. Uh, there's so much that goes into creating a network and each of you have touched on it and I don't want this opportunity to slip through the crack and we need each of you's knowledge to be able to pull this off and it, it, it's just so important to us and that's my comment. All right, thank you uh, Commissioner for that. I um, want to go to uh, representing Career Source Florida, Diane Head. Uh, Diane, did you have a question? I do, a quick question. Thank you panelists for joining us today. It's been very, very enlightening. Um, just a, a quick question about the um, the role that the electric cooperatives may have in the rural areas in providing um, middle mile, but mostly last mile service, internet service. I live in one of those places that is unserved. So I'm very interested in what that possibility could look like. Randy? Well, <laughs> great comment. Uh, I absolutely agree with everything you just said. Is the cooperative? They serve rural America. That's their members. Uh, it, I mean, they are probably one of the best positioned uh, organizations that want to and could provide broadband to their members. So, uh, I, my opinion is is that as you as the state tackles the broadband questions for rural uh, Florida, they absolutely should uh, involve the cooperative. There's ever reason. The cooperative has reasons to be at the home. They need to read the meter, and there's other services that they provide that a broadband network would absolutely assist them in, in getting that. But let's face facts, is that for rural America to grow, my opinion, is that broadband is a necessity. People move away, companies move away, or companies don't move to locations because lack of access of, of broadband technology. It, it's an economic development requirement, but the cooperative absolutely would be a great partner for this. All right, very good. Um, I have a question now from uh, Commissioner Jeff Kennard, a Citrus County Commissioner. He's representing the Hernando Citrus MPO. So, uh, Commissioner Kennard, you're self-muted. I, th I think we can't hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we got you. All right. Uh, I just, not necessarily a question. I just wanted to chime in and say that uh, uh, great, uh, great discussion from the panel today. I think Mr. Dudley absolutely nailed it in his last comments that, um, you know, the government needs to be very, very careful about uh, dipping our toes, I guess, into this, into this uh, providing broadband and so forth. I think our role in discussing how, how this plays into these corridors is providing access to right of way, providing the conduit uh, for the private industry to develop not only broadband uh, that works for right now, but broadband you know, access for 30 years from now, 40 years from now. And that's just not something that, that government is uh, pragmatic enough to be able to develop something, adapt to it. Uh, government is inherently a very dogmatic uh, entity and uh, we're best to provide that, that conduit and let the private industry handle it. So uh, good discussion today. Thank you everybody for being here and, uh, and walking us through this. Very good. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, the last uh, question we'll have from the task force today regarding this subject is going to come from uh, Taylor County uh, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Pam Fiegel. Commissioner, uh, you have a question today? 
Uh, yes. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hear you. Yes. Um, I frequently have complaints from people who do not have service or have very limited service in our county. So, on a local level, for a small, economically depressed county like Taylor County with very limited resources, my question was going to be how do we prepare for continuous service for our last mile? But then after Betsy just spoke, uh, I have to agree uh, with what Betsy said. I like her comments and, and, and I would like to see um, her suggestions put into place. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, one of the challenges, and, and we're about to get into it now, is, is you know, I want to thank our panelists for, for their time and uh, just, just you know, giving of themselves and, and their schedule and then putting themselves out there to be uh, thrown, th thrown a bunch of questions at and hop in there. And, and we appreciate your assistance uh, with us. Um, I echo, you know, the comments from our task force um, in regards to that. But I think, you know, Commissioner Fiegel, as we kind of transition now to, the next to the next part of the webinar, I think that's really key and will be highlighted as we talk about the needs. Um, you know, because what's what's unique about, about our corridor is the fact that um, you know we the, our study area for Suncoast Corridor is consists of eight counties, and seven out of the eight counties are below the state average when it comes to providing broad uh, high high speed internet to our rural citizens. Um, and so that's that that's a big that's a big gap and 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 uh, Ryan Asmus is is about to to give a presentation and will highlight some of those stats and and uh, and so forth. But uh, I want to wrap up the the panel discussion and and just just say uh, just say thank you very much to our panelists um, and we appreciate your time and your efforts today to help us with this uh, very important topic. All right, so uh, we're going to now move on to uh, to the impl implications for for needs and and uh, guiding principles and, and implementation. Again, we have public comment coming up here at 11:30, so we're we're going to try to try to get through this. Um, but thank you all for the questions and your time this morning. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Ryan Asmus, who's the FDOT production lead for the Suncoast Corridor who's gonna now recap the high level needs, the guiding principles and implementation strategies that you've already discussed um, uh, previously and, and talk a little bit about that for broadband. So uh, allow us to transfer this mic and uh, he'll pick up in just a second. All right, thank you, Greg. Uh, so, in previous task force meetings, we discussed benefits of expanding broadband and connectivity in various sectors within the study area. Here, we are showing a high level needs for broadband in study area expressed by the percent of rural population with at least one provider of high speed internet at 25 megabits per second for each county. The statewide average for rural areas with at least one high-speed internet provider is 80.3 percent, meaning that with the exception of Citrus County, the remaining counties that make up the Suncoast Corridor study area are below the average for high-speed internet access. The Florida Chamber Foundation's statewide connectivity goal is 100 percent access to high-speed internet by 2030 in order to sustain continued growth and ensure Florida remains successful. Therefore, MCORs will address this need by expanding broadband infrastructure and access to broadband service. In the previous task force meetings, we discussed benefits of expanding broadband and connectivity in various sectors of the economy and in society, including helping people with disabilities find jobs online and work from home. We also analyzed Federal Communication Commission data and mapped out internet providers in locations where they offer services. This information helps us to visually show unserved and underserved communities within the study area. We found that both fixed and mobile internet service providers are highly concentrated on urbanized areas. 
This is a heat map depicting areas with at least one service provider providing at least 25 megabits per second per census block. These are, these are areas with at least four service providers providing at least 25 megabits per second in a census block. The heat map shows gaps in internet coverage across the study area and especially in rural areas. Many people, especially in rural areas, have little or no access. Thus, there is a need to close the digital divide by increasing access to broadband to all residents in the study area. In previous meetings, we have discussed guiding principles and implementation strategies related to broadband technology. A draft broadband guiding principle to address broadband has been developed and is to provide opportunity for improving infrastructure, broadband, utilities, sewer and water, and examining potential for co-location. A draft imp implementation strategy has also been prepared and it, it is to work with private sector on opportunities for technology and enhancements along the corridor broadband, renewable energy, et cetera. The guiding principle shown on the screen is not all encompassing, but just reflects what has been captured from previous discussions. Additional guiding principles that we may consider include enhanced connectivity to both local and regional roadway networks, maintain consistency with utility master plans, maximize opportunities for partnerships with local agencies and private providers, leverage technology and innovation to ensure the most efficient and effective and environmentally sensitive transportation corridor. So with that, now I'd like to hand it back over to Greg for us to continue that discussion. Thank you, Ryan. Um, now, if everyone will look at this slide, uh, I'll kind of explain it to you. We'd like to use the remaining few minutes that we have here to tie the discussion uh, back to the work of the task force. So you might have seen this slide before in, in, in prior webinars. Uh, it basically shows how your recommendations on the need and guiding principles tie together and will help to instruct FDOT during the implementation. Um, we've repopulated this slide with the topics that Ryan just summarized. And, uh, and from your prior discussions related to needs, guiding principles, and, and implementation or instructions for broadband. Uh, based on what you've seen uh, or just heard from the panel, we'd like to get your thoughts uh, if, if anyone has any discussion in regards to this. But as you can see, it kind of goes from a high level needs on the left-hand side, uh, where it's just to expand rural broadband infrastructure and access to broadband service to a little bit more uh, defined uh, guiding principle that just says provide opportunity for improving infrastructure, including broadband utilities, sewer and water, and examining potential for co-location, down to a more specific draft instruction for the project development phase and beyond, which would say to work with private sector on opportunities for technology enhancements along the corridor for broadband, renewable energy, et cetera. So uh, we will, well, we obviously don't have time right now to be able to exhaustively discuss this. This just, if it will, if you will, this really tees up the next virtual meeting that we're gonna have on June 23rd, where we're gonna get into more discussion about not only this guiding principle, but others. And so um, it's not necessarily to flush out any, uh, you know, major issues uh, today or get into the, the, the details of this today, but does any of the task force have any, any just brief comments about this or any questions in regard to this um, that we need to, to maybe address at the next uh, virtual meeting? Um, Thomas Hawkins, Thousand Friends of Florida, I'm gonna to come to you first. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I hear you. Fantastic, thanks. I, I think we need to do work on our draft guiding principle here. And there's two things about it that are shortcomings. 
One is it says provide the opportunity for, for improving infrastructure. We absolutely need to be improving infrastructure, not simply providing an opportunity. If we end this process, just have providing a conduit where somebody else can come in and provide infrastructure, we're not taking advantage of the funding made available through MCORs, and we're not uh, following the legislature's instruction to achieve broadband connectivity in the area. The second uh, issue here in the draft guiding principle is where it says that we need to examine the potential for co-location. We absolutely should do that, but that's not enough. Um, but an excellent point that Will made in uh, Will Watts made in his introductory presentation is that the ideal corridors for transportation and the ideal corridors for broadband are not necessarily the same. So we should, in addition to looking for opportunities for co-location, should look for those corridors that are principally uh, utility or broadband corridors and identify them and place infrastructure in them. Um, so I, I, I feel like I'm being a little bit bold in my language, but I, I really, really think that uh, these draft guiding principles are, are falling short. The potential to develop broadband through the MCORS process is an exciting opportunity. I think it's one that unites folks all across the task force. Um, and so I, I, I'll close having said those and invite other task force members who, who, who would agree that this is an extremely important opportunity um, to make sure we get this language right and improve it in those two ways. Thanks, Greg. And those are, and then no, thank you. And that's that's exactly. And again, uh, today was basically to show you, hey, based off what, where we, the previous discussions, this is where the, the the draft guiding principle related to broadband stands today. As you can see, for example, it's tied in with utilities and sewer and water and uh, so forth. It, one of the questions that that needs to be proposed and, and it will be asked, I'm sure, at the next virtual meeting on the 23rd is, do we need to break out broadband and have its own guiding principle? Um, and, and again, key things of, of that meeting is going to be to try to figure out how we can sharpen some of the, not only this guiding principle, but the other general guiding principles that we've gotten into. So um, I want to go to Charles Lee, uh, representing Audubon, Florida. Um, Charles, are you there? Yes, um, I think clearly this guide, this guiding principle needs to be sharpened and made less general. I think that it should be a given that there be conduit included in the construction of any MCORS corridor. Uh, I would agree with Thomas Hawkins. I think that it needs to go beyond that. I think that the cost calculations of the MCORS project need to include the full cost of providing the broadband service, uh, not just associated with the immediate corridor, but associated with the rest of the infrastructure to populate the urban area with broadband. And that a task that ought to be undertaken uh, as we proceed toward uh, the final report is there needs to be a cost estimate of essentially building the infrastructure in the areas served within this broad corridor map for broadband. And that ought to be put on the table as a cost that's associated and analyzed in terms of the feasibility of MCORS. Very good. Thank you, Charles. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Pegeen Hanrahan. Uh, she was uh, not on initially, at least I didn't have her on, but she has joined us. And uh, Pegeen, do you have a uh, a comment in regards to this? I do, and I apologize. I had a conflict this morning, but um, I think Charles may have just touched on what I was going to ask, but um, as we move forward in this analysis, I would like some information, not just on um, providing the broadband, but making sure people can afford access to it. I think that um, there are many examples across the state and certainly in my own community that um, broadband is available but it's outside the uh, <clears throat> capacity of people to pay for it um, and uh, I just feel like that's an important piece for folks to understand is just is to kind of look at the fact that there are many many places that have access but it's still too expensive for, for mm. folks to, to get into their home um, the other thing I'll just mention, and I don't 
I mean, it's been so long since I've spent a lot of time working in this area or thinking about this area, but I will share that when um, I was in elective office uh, with the city of Gainesville, we actually built a fiber network through our public utility because we, you know, it's essentially, you know, and this is 20 years ago now, but essentially, uh, you know, if the private sector could come in and make money off of doing so, they would have. The problem was is that with the high-tech, you know, university and hospital community that we had, we had the demand, the need before it was really a financially um, beneficial case for the private sector actors. And I sort of see this area as where, you know, Gainesville was 20 or 30 years ago. Um, I agree that there are lots of barriers for private sector or for public sector actors to get into this type of work. Um, we really only did it out of necessity, but one of the speakers stated, and I really, my recollection, at least from my time trying to work with it, it was an absolutely accurate statement that the legislature has put a lot of restrictions on local governments from getting involved in this area, at least in part because they are competing head to head with the private sector. And you don't want to, you know, tip that playing field too dramatically, I guess I would say in either direction. So I just feel like there, as, as has been said by, uh, the previous two speakers, there's a lot still left to work on in this area. I do think there's a tremendous opportunity, but I think it should also be balanced with the fact that there are likely millions and millions of Floridians today who could get access to broadband if only they could afford the monthly cost. So I'll just leave it there. Okay. Um, Commissioner Jeff Kennard, uh, representing Hernando County MPO, uh, uh, or Hernando Citrus MPO. Did you have uh, did you have a, a, a comment in regards to this? Right, try it now. Are you there? <laughs> All right, there we go. Uh, just just briefly, I wouldn't have an issue with uh, breaking out the broadband away from the water and sewer utilities. Uh, uh, we certainly don't see a whole lot of changes coming with the. Uh, the transmission of, of water and sewer over the next 10 to 20 years, but broadband obviously is going to change dramatically over the next year or two. And that's, that's again, that's just best fit for the private industry to handle that. And um, I look, look forward to seeing that develop. Uh, contrary to the speaker, I, I would not support uh, us getting into the business subsidizing uh, broadband uh, access. Uh, uh, we do need to provide access to the right of way. We need to provide uh, the conduit for the private industry to move in and get broadband to these more rural areas. Uh, but I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't want to see us get into the subsidizing business. Okay. Um, and then um, let's see here. We've got. Uh, Randy Wilkerson representing the Florida Rural Water Association. Randy, do you have a, a, something you'd like to add to this as we're, we're trying to trying to wrap it up? But uh, but I want to make for sure people have an opportunity to say something if they need to. Yeah, Greg, just wanted to touch on the point that coexist for this infrastructure with the broadband and the water and the sewer is we need to keep in mind that, you know, over existing period of time, repairs have got to be made. So we just kind of want to keep in mind that, you know, as we dig depths or whatever, that we don't damage another infrastructure, if that makes sense. Very good. Very good. Yeah, no, that does make sense. And we're, like I said, at the, at the, um, at the, at the virtual meeting that we're going to have uh, at the end of this month on the 23rd, um, we're going to get into some of the, some of the details of this. So, um, uh, just keep just keep that in mind and be thinking about that from a standpoint from from now over the next uh, over the next couple of weeks. Be thinking about specifically for broadband and with in light of the discussion today, how can we uh, from a, a guiding principle standpoint, um, how can we um, you know revise this guiding principle to make it more uh, more acceptable to to the to the group um, as a whole. So. Anyway, uh, with that being said, I do want to thank everybody for 
your attendance today. I am going to, we are going to move forward in the agenda. I'm going to turn it back over to the chairman, Secretary Greg Evans, uh, to discuss some next steps. All right, I'll take just a quick minute to again, uh, thank you, Greg, and to the uh, entire team for making this webinar what I feel like is a, a huge success for us. And like you said, a few reminders recap here. Uh, first, the, today's presentation and webinar recording will be posted on the website. Uh, secondly, we're gonna continue to support you with technical briefings uh, regarding this online tool and also uh, further discussion on avoidance and attraction areas. And uh, thirdly, Again, we have uh, scheduled uh, the next virtual meeting for June 23rd. So look for that agenda coming out uh, where we get continue to work on our, our needs and guiding principles. And uh, finally, we'll be in touch as soon as we get a sense of timing when our future uh, in-person or hybrid type meeting uh, will be uh, scheduled. So this concludes our formal presentations for today. We'll move on to public comment. And I want to just continue to emphasize how important uh, input is from the public uh, during our meetings and webinars. <clears throat> uh, but this is not the only way for the public to provide us input. Again, anytime, day or night, public can provide comments at fdot.listens at dot.state.fl.us. And that will become a part of the uh, public record. So that adjourns my comments for today. We'll move into the public comment period. And Greg, you're the lucky guy again to receive the mic. Very good. And as you say that, I realized that earlier whenever I was giving out that email address, I gave the wrong email address. I said at fdot.state, but it's not. There's no F in, in there. So it's fdot.listens at dot.state.fl.us. So thanks for, for correcting me there because that was, uh, didn't I, think, did that. I think you did. Yeah, you corrected me and didn't even realize it. Um, all right, so we'll, we're not going to go into the public comment period. The public comment period is expected to last, as I said earlier, of approximately two hours. As always, we encourage uh, everyone to stay engaged during this portion of the webinar. And uh, if you are interested in viewing the task force members uh, who are in attendance, uh, please feel free to do so by expanding the box uh, of the list of attendees in the GoToMeeting menu. Uh, requests for to comment that were received by 5 p.m. yesterday will be addressed during the public comment period in the order the request was made. If you did not respond when you were called um, or when you are called, we will provide a second chance at the end of the public comment period. When your name is called to actually speak, we will unmute your line in order for you to provide comment within your allotted time of three minutes. You will hear a tone when you have 30 seconds remaining and then another tone when your time is up. The line will be muted after three minutes, so please keep your eye on the clock and listen for those tones. If you have uh, more information to share with the group, you can provide additional comments in writing for further consideration. You can send those comments anytime at the previously mentioned email address, fdot.listens at dot.state.fl.us. Only one person at a time will be unmuted. If you have self-muted, please be sure to unmute before speaking. I'll go ahead and identify the first three speakers, and then we'll begin that public comment period with the first public speaker. Uh, first public speaker is going to be Lindsey Cross from St. Petersburg, Florida. Second will be Michael McGrath from Fort Myers, Florida. And third will be Amy Datz from Tallahassee, Florida. So uh, again, we'll move to uh, our first speaker today, Lindsey Cross from St. Petersburg, Florida. Lindsey, you have three minutes. Good morning. This, can you hear me? Can. Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, good morning. This is Lindsay Cross with Florida Conservation Voters. Uh, today on round three of these webinars, we again asked DOT to put the brakes on this process. We're in the middle of a global health and economic pandemic. People are protesting for a more just and equitable future. These are urgent threats that must be addressed to ensure the health and prosperity of our state and nation. On the contrary, there is no urgency to destroy natural and rural Florida and to jeopardize our water, wildlife, agriculture, and hard-earned taxpayer dollars. The only urgency is an artificial one created by the passage of SB 7068, wherein politicians, not planners or the people, have dictated what our state needs. This process has represented bad government from the beginning, 
and barreling through with these webinars simply continues this sham of a process. On March 28th, DOT Secretary Tebow received a letter from the First Amendment Foundation formally requesting the DOT halt the webinars. Based on provisions of Chapter 120.54, subparagraph 5 of Florida statutes, the M4 task force shall hold public meetings in accordance with Chapter 286. This is the chapter that upholds Florida's government in the Sunshine Law. DOT, you yourself as staff have admitted that the webinar technology has not always worked. Technical problems that prevented interested persons from attending should have resulted in a termination in the proceedings. Instead, you have insisted on moving forward with even more, scheduling six meetings this month. The current structure of the webinars continues to shortchange the public and doesn't allow for open dialogue between task force members about the true need and justifications for these roads. While you can claim that the number of participants has increased, the opportunity for meaningful participation has de decreased. Speaking into a computer screen is not the same as engaging in a face-to-face -face interaction. Quite frankly, discussions about broadband and technology, which you've openly admitted can be accomplished without a toll road or a diversion, there is still no evidence that these roads are needed, nor that they are financially viable. I applaud the First Amendment Foundation for sharing the letter with DOT staff and each of the task force members. As our state and nation grapple with significant health and justice issues, we ask that you halt these webinars and any further discussions with task force members until the process is fully accessible and in the sunshine. Because as facilitator Greg Evans said earlier in reference to the panel members mute button, we trust y'all, we just don't trust you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Michael McGrath, uh, organizer of the Sierra Club based out of Fort Myers, Florida. Um, I think it's pretty clear that by holding communities hostage by forcing the choose between um, broadband connectivity and a highway that runs straight through the backyards is wrong and disingenuous. Those who use this false narrative to promote MCORs are simply lying to the public. Rural communities don't have to make that choice. Here is the truth. There are alternatives that are both cheaper, less environmentally damaging, and can accomplish the same connectivity goals much sooner than building toll roads that will likely not be completed until 20, 30 or later. The communities that are currently without broadband access simply do not have to wait for new roads to be completed to get connectivity. These toll roads are not necessary costs of bringing broadband to underserved communities across rural Florida. Aerial broadband, microwave technologies, and even low orbit, low orbit satellite, for example, are one of the many well-documented services and also emerging technologies that can be done independently in road construction and for a fraction of the costs. It's true that the government can play an important role in subsidizing infrastructure needed to make high-speed broadband plumbing available and accessible to all. However, a toll road is infrastructure investment is fiscally responsible considering that existing roads infrastructure could in theory be used for conduit access as well. We need real solutions and we need them now. Exit now, don't build the road, bring high-speed broadband independently instead. Thank you. Hello, my name is Amy Datz. I have been a professional. Hello, my name is Amy Datz. I have been a professional environmental scientist for the past 40 years and an environmental legislative activist, not lobbyist, for the past seven years. This panel and the legislation authorizing this project has identified that 20% of Floridians in the region of this project, or over 700,000 Floridians, have no or poor internet connectivity. This deficiency covers 43% of Florida counties. This internet connectivity would not only improve their quality of life, but also help reduce air pollution because they can use telemedicine, telecommuting, and online education. The opportunities to reduce trips and therefore air pollution and congestion from this area are limitless. Getting to an emergency room by car can take many precious minutes. Getting to a doctor by telemedicine can save lives. The citizens in this area are being left out of our current work at home program uh, during this pandemic, putting their health in further jeopardy and keeping them in high child poverty and high unemployment. 
Internet access as well as funding from this project for training in many areas of employment will allow these low income or unemployed parents to gain better and higher paying jobs and improve their quality of lives as well as their children's lives. To my knowledge, the project opponents have not identified funding sources or solutions to reduce child poverty and unemployment in the, in the areas of the project. Studies have already demonstrated that the children in these areas are falling behind the students who do have internet access to their teachers and educational materials. The project opponents' children are benefiting from their uh, internet access. To those of the project in the project area, they say, let those children eat cake. This internet connectivity will also allow us to monitor and study wildlife movement through wildlife crossings. I believe that wildlife does not want to eat the opponent's cake. Money talks. There are other ways to get broadband, but those funding sources have not been identified or allocated in Florida's state budget. In the case of this project, money does and will provide the citizens in this area to talk. The opponents of this project are saying they are happy with their internet connectivity and their use of the internet to oppose this project. But the Floridians that benefit from this project, to them they say, let them eat cake. As sea level rises, I-95 and 19 might be underwater. The 79% of the Floridians who live on the coast will move north into the center of the state. Many of those who do not move because of sea level rise may be the current opponents to this project. They may be cutting off their own noses to spite their face. They need internet connectivity to maintain their high quality of life. Will the opponents of this project say to their fellow citizens who have to move up the coast, let them eat cake. Thank you for your comment. Up next is Jim Tatum from Tampa, Florida. Jim, you are unmuted. Now, can you hear me? Yes, sir, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the task force. Uh, what these toll roads are about is a few men in power kowtowing to a few others who are poised to get richer and take away more of the very little we have left of rural Florida. Wasted money is the least of the flaws of this politically motivated boondoggle, but there's plenty of that. The worst is that development will engulf some of the few rural areas left in Florida, sucking out more water that will further deplete our springs, rivers, and aquifer. And all of this is for nothing, as studies have already done, been done by the I-75 Relief Task Force that, that have shown that we do not need these new corridors, only modifications to the current ones. This is about the final destruction of Florida, the paving over. This will be like Highway 200 around Ocala, stoplight after stoplight, fast food after fast food, gas stations and movie theaters, uncontrolled sprawl, quick bucks and pave it over. No more gopher tortoises, barred owls, turkeys, no more deer, no more green pastures, wetlands and countryside. This is about poor planning or rather no planning, poor thinking or rather no thinking. This is about the richest man in Florida becoming richer. This is about spineless politicians taking the easy way out and disregarding the will of the people who elected them. This is about politics at its worst, trade-offs to good old boys. This is about tickets to riches for a few people and tickets to destruction for our wildlife, aquifer, rural landscapes, agricultural lands, peace and quiet. This is about money and nothing else. These roads are not a done deal. They are on shaky ground and we must get that message out. Instead of sitting there choosing routes and making adjustments, we must simply negate the whole deal. We must tell our governor that we simply want no part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tatum, for your comment. Up next is Jenny Welch from Old Town, Florida. Jenny, you are unmuted. Yes, hello. I am here to talk again about the proposed route through uh, Dixie County and Lafayette County, the proposed route along State Road 349. I'm again asking that a meeting be held once we are allowed to have meetings be held in Old Town to let the residents of Old Town know that this road is coming through, that this road may come through. This road, if it comes through that area, will decimate the city of Old Town, the rural atmosphere of Old Town. It will also destroy many people's homes, which is not on your 
um, map of places to avoid. This is many, several, several people's homes. And the many of the people in Old Town and Hatch Bend, they do not know that this is a proposed route. FDOT owes it to these people to let them know that this is a proposed route, that their homes are in danger. I am asking again for FDOT to let these people know that this is a proposed route. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Welch, for your comment. Up next is James Kern from St. Augustine, Florida. James, showing that you're not connected to audio. Try to connect and we'll circle back to you. Up next is Matthew Schwartz from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Matthew, you are unmuted. Matthew Schwartz, you are unmuted. One last time, Matthew Schwartz, you are unmuted. If not, we will circle back. Up next, Rebecca Parsons from Tallahassee, Florida. Rebecca, you are unmuted. Rebecca Parsons, you are unmuted. One last time, Rebecca Parsons, you are unmuted. Okay, we'll circle back. Up next is Wanda Clough from Naples, Florida. Wanda, you are self-muted. Wanda Clough from Naples, Florida, you are self-muted if you wanna unmute. One more time, Wanda Clough, you are self-muted if you want to unmute on your end. If not, we will circle back. Moving on, Susan Caruso from Broward, Florida, you are unmuted. You are self-muted. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Hi, I've been listening to the um, panel discussion this morning, so I'm going to kind of freestyle. So this is a little bit of a flow of consciousness, but um, I've been in the position where I've made many trips into Fort White Subway so that I could get on the internet. But I don't think the toll roads is going to be the answer to my connectivity issues. What's going to happen is like Dustin said with Hendry County, if you keep putting in more, there's gonna be more people coming in and more people coming in and the same thing's gonna happen over and over and over. And it still doesn't guarantee that last mile. As a matter of fact, I, suspe I suspect that that will stay exactly the same until people have jobs and can afford connectivity so this money that we're spending on m cores is badly spent when we could spend it directly on the issues of connectivity when um, these gentlemen are saying it helps when everybody works together local governments electrical co-ops i know in my area there are plenty of power lines i'm not sure why they can't co-locate with those that are right in my neighborhood and would give me access directly. So, 
shoot. Even on. Yes, you are. Okay, thank you. Um, and I also wanted to address the issue you said so many people are coming on to these calls, and it partly is the webinar um, format, but also a lot of people are finding out about this now, more and more people, and I suspect most of those people who have called for the public comments in greater, greater numbers are saying, don't do it. And it's also rather ironic that you showed that slide where eight out of the uh, seven out of the eight communities don't have adequate internet access and you expect them to join this web webinar how are they going to do that you're not hearing from the people who need this access so this is basically just a farce in the first place we need to have a no road build but in lieu of that we should at least suspend this um, non-democratic process until people can meet face to face and you can see how many people are really against this the people that you say you're going to serve let's spend the money directly on job programs small business loans and connectivity directly thank you thank you Ms. Caruso for your comment up next is Larry Perrin from Crawfordville Florida Larry, you are unmuted. Larry Perrin from Crawfordville, Florida, you are unmuted. Larry, you just self muted if you'd like to unmute. Provide your comment. If not, we'll circle back. One last time, Larry Perrin. Up next is Grant Gilhart from Tallahassee, Florida. Grant, you are unmuted. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, this is Grant Gilhart from Tallahassee, Florida. I'm with uh, the Florida Sierra Club and the Big Ben Sierra Club. Um, I have uh, drive down US-19 from Perry down to uh, Crystal River a number of times. Um, and a lot of times, or most of the times, all the times, there are very few cars on the road. And sometimes I am the only car on the road. Um, that's why I question the need for this, uh, the turnpike or the toll road. Um, FDA, uh, FDOT has not shown that the toll, toll road will pay for itself, has not shown a documented need for the toll road. Um, and with this COVID-19 pandemic that's going on right now, impacting the lives and our economy, our resources, our limited resources should be addressing our public health and emergency needs, our devastated economy, and not to go ahead and build toll roads that really nobody needs or wants. I've not heard a lot of support for building these toll roads. And like I say, I drive down US 19, I see really no need for the toll roads. These issues of broadband service and sewer along these corridors is really irrelevant to the need for the toll road. Uh, sewer systems and uh, internet and broadband service can be provided without constructing this toll road that will cost literally billions of dollars. And again, there has been no documentation or data showing that these toll roads would pay for themselves. Uh, the current Suncoast Parkway doesn't pay for itself. So basically you're putting uh, this cost on everybody in the state of Florida and toll roads should be designed to pay for themselves. So 
In closing, um, this funds and the money used here should be used for infrastructure improvements where there really is a traffic problem and not in an area that there is no documented need or traffic problems. Uh, again, really no build option is the only option here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gearhart, for your comment. Up next is Robert Rossigal from Hamden, Connecticut. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, sir, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm calling on uh, several issues. Uh, first of all, when you were outlining the upcoming meetings, uh, I didn't see anything about uh, the option of improving uh, I-75. Maybe that was brought up before. I haven't been able to uh, attend all the meetings. Uh, the other option uh, is uh, using the uh, 400 foot, typically uh, massive uh, high voltage power line corridors. Uh, I'm from Citrus County. I was born in Brooksville because we didn't even have a hospital or doctor in Citrus County in 1949. And I uh, live in Connecticut now and uh, I'm getting ready to, to move to Longmont, uh, Colorado. And uh, uh, basically, uh, um, I, I don't know why these other options aren't being looked at. Uh, if the New Jersey Turnpike had not been approved over the years, the Northeast Corridor would not exist. And uh, I live five miles. The other thing is, I'm kind of tired of being lied to by DOT. Uh, these are eight lane highways. They're not four lane. And we proved this in court, federal court, and are going further. Uh, the other thing is, is that the um, um, uh, cost of the road is not 134 million. That's the lane construction cost. Now to the point of the fiber optic, 25, uh, megabits per second. That's kind of like a dinosaur. Uh, a kid can't play a game on that. Uh, Longmont, Colorado put in their own uh, power plant in 1912. Uh, they just spent uh, $45 million on a one gig uh, owned by the town uh, uh, internet uh, fiber optic service. Uh, it's the fastest in Colorado, one of the fastest in the country. Yeah, they did not put in any toll roads to do this. And you don't need conduit. This goes right in the ground. Uh, I've designed as an architect factories that make uh, high voltage cable for offshore oil rigs and for fiber optic, et cetera. And uh, I don't remember doing toll roads to make them happen. Uh, this is just ridiculous. Uh, I don't know uh, where it came from except a bunch of legislators or basically decided for some other reason uh, to put these in. Uh, and I'm totally against this. I don't see options really being explored. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Roscow. Up next is Steve Sutherland from Panama City, Florida. Steve, you are unmuted. Steve Sutherland from Panama City, Florida, you are unmuted. One last call, Steve Sutherland from Panama City, Florida, you are unmuted. If not, we will circle back. Up next, Matthew Schwartz from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. 
Matthew, you are unmuted. Okay, you can hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, give me a second. Let's up some notes here. So I'm Matthew Schwartz. I represent the South Florida Wildlands Association. And um, it's a good discussion from not only the panelists, but also a lot of the uh, people in the public. Um, I'm just going to bring up some facts that Florida already has 719 miles of toll road, more than any state in the U.S. We're going to add another 320 miles. We're going to dwarf any state of the U.S. as far as toll roads. We also have 274,000 lane miles of highway. We're the seventh most in the United States. And only Illinois is the only state smaller than Florida that has more lane miles. So there's plenty of road. Um, the Florida East Coast Railroad since 2013 has allowed the Florida East Coast Railroad corridor to be used for broadband. And they've laid, laid uh, broadband between Jacksonville and Miami. So lots and lots of alternatives to doing this with MCORs. Nobody has made the case, and in fact, the whole way this project, and everybody's talking about that, there was no need, need analysis done for this project before it, got going, before it got going. There was no impact analysis whatsoever. What I would have liked to see at this meeting to begin with is a panelist or somebody from FDOT saying, look, this is how we could provide uh, broadband right now with the existing roadways, with the existing corridors, and it's going to cost this much money. And this is how we could do it with MCORs and do a comparison. That's usually how projects get started. And that's just looking at the, the broadband thing. Everything else, the transportation, the sewer, everything else needs to be considered as well. This project at some point is going to move to federal review because there's no way that the Army Corps is going to be able to issue a permit of this without it. You're going to be crossing wetlands, destroying wetlands, paving over wetlands. You're going to be crossing streams and creeks. All of those are going to require an Army Corps review, and that means an environmental impact statement. In that environmental impact statement, we're going to be exposed to a range of reasonable alternatives. I assume if they don't do that, if they don't do full NEPA on that, there'll be other consequences for that that'll come later on down the line. But as people are saying, there's no argument that broadband is needed. You keep Folks keep making the argument, we need broadband. That's got to be a logical fallacy somewhere. I'm not an expert on the rules of logic, but saying we need broadband, therefore we need MCORs, when we know, when the experts you're bringing in here are telling you, you could do this with existing right-of-ways. And adding 320 miles, think about the cost of this. When I did research on the internet, I was looking at uh, uh, prices of somewhere around $30,000 per mile. Now we're hearing today, some people said it could be up to $100,000 per mile. $100,000 uh, times 320, what does that come out to? $32 million, uh, $320 million? Or I, I haven't done, done, done the, uh, don't have it in front of me right now. But it's a fraction. Up, Mr. Schwartz, I appreciate your comment. Up next is Rebecca Parsons from Tallahassee, Florida. Hi, this is Becky Parsons. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, I travel from Tallahassee to Tampa frequently, and the extension from um, Suncoast Parkway from Highway 98 down to Tampa, quite frankly, is a welcome uh, roadway because Highway 19 and I-75 would be my other only other alternatives to get to Tampa. They are both overcrowded and both dangerous. So I welcome being able to drive on the parkway from 98 down to Tampa. However, that road was when it was originally constructed went through rural areas with no development. And over the years, I have seen nothing but urban sprawl happen, happen at every um, exit along that roadway. Um, it's brought nothing but fast food restaurants, apartment complexes, um, nothing that is attractive at all. Now the extension from Highway 98 up to up to Jefferson County does not make sense. It's not going to alleviate any traffic issues along the way. Highway 19 all the way up to Jefferson County hardly has any traffic. So it seems to me that the only way you're trying to sell this road is to bring broadband and there are other options for bringing broadband. That seems like a bogus uh, justification for it. And thank you very much and I'll sign off now. 
Thank you, Mrs. Parsons, for your comment. Up next, Wanda Clough from Naples, Florida. Wanda, you are unmuted. Wanda, you are self muted. Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Thank you. And hello, and thank you for this opportunity. My name is Wanda Clough. I reside in Naples, Florida. I'm a mom and a Florida business owner for 35 years. I have witnessed our waterways degrade from paradise to paradise lost. A main ingredient in this degradation is sewage. My question is concerning sewer utilities. When we see the short and long-term, when will we see the short and long-term financial and structural plans for sewage infrastructure to accommodate the growth that will be spurred by these new roads? This infrastructure will be necessary to accommodate the 10 million new Florida residents these corridors will attract. One component to planning into the future is to consider the past. Example, Miami-Dade and their growth along tow roads and connector highways. Florida does not need more roads at this time. Florida needs a healthier environment for its residents and nature. Again, thank you for this opportunity to speak and I look forward to hearing more about the future sewer utilities planned for our state. Thank you very kindly. Thank you for your comment. Up next is Steve Sutherland from Panama City, Florida. Steve, you are unmuted. Hi, uh, this is uh, former Congressman Steve Sutherland, and uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Very good. Very good. First of all, I want to thank uh, uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity, this platform. Uh, I think um, uh, it is incumbent upon um, um, you know government to to continue uh, during a pandemic to provide services and to not hit the pause button and freeze. And so uh, I think uh, people expect us to plan and, and, uh, and look to the future. Uh, and so I, I thank you all for this platform and being able to, to have uh, uh, these opportunities to listen and to discuss uh, the future. Uh, I also want to say, um, you know, while, you know, we, we, we have some, some, uh, some challenges ahead of us in, in, in the state of Florida and the fact that, you know, we've got a population that continues to grow at, you know, a, a thousand people a day uh, uh, prior to the, the uh, pandemic. And so I would love to, 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 uh, to have um, an opportunity to have everyone come to the state um, and, and, and not have more housing and not have more roads and have, uh, you know, more environmental opportunities. But we, we've got a plan where everybody can, can, um, uh, can facilitate uh, a quality of life, uh, wildlife, the environment, as well as people and businesses that, that pr provide the opportunity for government to, uh, to lend its services to us. So um, thank, I just want to thank the task force for their work. I want to thank them for the great job they're doing. Thank you for this platform uh, using technology. Um, uh, thank you for, for wanting to, to take technology out to even the rural counties um, for educational opportunities and connect them to the world. Um, just thank you very much for this. And, and I look, I've enjoyed being on all of these and I will continue to be on these uh, going forward. And um, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Mr. Sutherland, for your comment. At this time, that ends our public comment period. We appreciate your attendance in our webinar. Thank you.